Hello again, friends. And you are our friends, and this is not a rerun. This is a fresh episode of Jim Cornette's drive through right here during this festive holiday season where everyone is getting gifts and COVID. I'm your host, the great Brian Last, and of course with me, the star of the drive through Mr. Jim Cornette. Boy, what an introduction. Gifts and COVID. The Holy galloping mackerel. Mr. Jim Cornette. You know, I, I got food poisoning for Christmas. Did you really? I'm still not sure when I'm going to use it. <laughs> but uh, very good. Very I good. want to say it was it was 70 degrees here Saturday afternoon, Christmas Day in Louisville, Kentucky. It was the Thursday morning before Christmas. It was 23 degrees and Saturday afternoon. It was 70. And all week this week, it's in the 60s. We got the windows open. Getting the fresh air in, out in the yard in a t-shirt. It's positively balmy. How's things up there where you're at? Today, as we are recording, is a rather cold day here in the Northeast. <laughs> Some snow. How cold is it, Ollie? <laughs> There's lots of snow dropping from the sky right now. But tomorrow and the rest of the week, everything heats up, so it's kind of just a little tease of the winter we haven't had so far. A tease of things to come. We had 10 inches of snow by this point last year. We haven't had any this year. That's what she said. You've been using that a lot. Have you been watching The Office? The Office, yes. But that, but that's an old, I mean, that's so old in the South. I know, but I'm just that's wondering, so the fact you've been using it so frequently lately makes me wonder if you've been watching The Office. I, I have been going through The Office since it's on now in so many different times and places you can see it seems like every every time you turn the tv on you see the office so i've been trying to catch up you have a favorite episode not yet i really see i told you here a while back several people had asked you asked one time do you watch the office no because it had it had not come to my attention i guess it started so long ago i was still traipsing around the world doing the wrestling thing as the kids say these days and then I didn't know who anybody was. It's a large cast, a, a, a numerous seasons. I figured, well, I, I should watch it from the start. You know, I got the OCD. I like start things at the beginning. And I never, you know, made the effort to get all the box sets or whatever to sit down from square one. But then they changed the schedule on Comedy Central or whatever, and they've got it on. And I start watching. I get a tickle out of one scene. And then I've started kind of getting a feel for who these people are, even though some of them I learned backwards. Sort of like watching AEW wrestling. The, you know, the booking is backwards where the guy debuts in the main event and a year and a half later he's, he's winning his preliminary matches. So, but I'm still appreciating it. Probably more than AEW wrestling. Do you have a favorite character? I like Dwight. Dwight is... is That's not a surprise. Enough ...that, uh, you know, I mean, he's... <laughs> What was the line on one just the day before yesterday? He was he had different wigs to impersonate different members of the office. He said, "You'll never know when you need to bear a passing resemblance." To someone. <laughs> I'm trying to take that to heart and use that advice in my in my life. But uh, I like Creed Bratton. Do you know Creed on the show? Is he the the? Oh God damn it! No, that's Toby. Toby's the the HR guy that's right. very timid. He's nobody's favorite. Well, no, no, nobody likes him. He's just, he's standing over in the corner every once in a while. Creed is the old white guy. And the hysterical thing is, his name on the show is Creed Bratton, played in real life. His name is also Creed Bratton. And he was the bass player, I think, in the grassroots. What? Yeah. Not every version, but like one of the ones with hits, because they had Live for Today, they had Midnight Confessions. Sooner or later. I mean, it had several hits. Yeah. He's on at least two of them, I think. So he... And he plays at himself. Any time <laughs> which on, is on The Office. He could just bust into, That's my midnight confession when I tell the world that I love you. See, that's the thing. He doesn't play the musician Creed Bratton. He just plays a character named Creed Bratton. <laughs> <laughs> so next time you watch and you see him on the show, you'll start to appreciate him. He's one of the weirder characters ever. and. Brilliant. Well, well, wait a minute. Why would I appreciate one of the weirder characters ever? Are you trying to say that we'll oh, see no, some right. similarities? You're right. I should just think when you would appreciate Dwight, the weird guy who lives on a beet farm 
who gets along with no one, who's always plotting to hurt people and do tricky shit, to rise up in the corporate world of Dunder Mifflin. Well, I, I, <laughs> I don't see anything wrong with man trying to get ahead. Uh, anyway. Have you seen the episode yet? where Michael and I don't want to spoil anything you haven't seen. So I'm going to be careful. Michael and his girlfriend. Well, I don't know. I'm watching this in all different orders. I don't know what the fuck I'm watching. I don't know whether I've seen it or not. Okay. Some of them I've seen six times already. All right. What well, were you going to say? I was going to say the episode where they have people over their house and it just turns into a complete disaster. And you haven't well, seen boy, it. Boy, thank you for nailing that down so specifically. Anyone who knows that show knows what I'm talking about. Well, apparently I don't know the show yet. Not yet, but you will. Not yet. I like will. You Always Sunny. I'll take notes. And speaking, and Always Sunny just, just finished. Well, we, we talked about that last week. I'm sorry. I'm frazzled because of Christmas has been in there. Our schedule is all thrown off. I understand it's not only Christmas season, but also on the bus season. Is that correct? That is correct. Of course, people who subscribe to the podcast feeds for the drive through and the experience do both. I don't know why anyone wouldn't know that this time of year we have our greatest hits, our best ofs, our omnibus collections, multiple hour shows compiling some of the greatest moments from the drive through and the experience. The current one up right now in the experience feed is the Vince McMahon Stories Omnibus. It's a two parter, almost eight hours of conversation about Vince McMahon, stories about Vince McMahon from the shows. We have some more coming up later this week, but also some that are going to be up only on the YouTube channel. Subscribe today to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. So wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This, you're burying the lead here. You're saying, what, Brian Last, out of your own chicken lips, that even though even the people who listen to their podcast and say their prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms. No, that's something else you're saying. You're saying that people who subscribe to the podcast feed will hear, obviously, the on-the-bus episode about all these Vince McMahon stories, and but that the people who subscribe to the YouTube channel will hear exclusive stuff put together specifically for them that is not going out on any of the podcast feeds? Technically, I guess you could say that. Again, they're omnibuses, so they're compilations of previously distributed content. Well, yes, but if you so have I don't want to lock it, myself in. Stephen Pinu would be very proud of me right now. I'm, I refuse to, uh, to agree to what you just said. But I'm saying if, if you subscribe to the podcast, but you don't subscribe to the YouTube, don't expect this extra stuff this week to just pop up. You got to go over and subscribe to the YouTube channel too, and that, which is free. Also, the, ne the only step from there is us paying people to do it. And good Lord, only a low class imbecile would do that. <laughs> um, but anyway, but you're, you're just saying you got to subscribe to both or have the podcasts on your feed and subscribe to the YouTube channel to make sure you don't miss anything. I would say that out this week. I would say that make sure you don't miss anything. Subscribe to the podcast feeds as well as the YouTube channel. But the content that's going to go up on the YouTube channel may eventually go up on the feed. We'll see. We'll see how everyone behaves. Well, let's change topics in this carefully designed edit right here, Jim. And uh, actually, let's go to something we mentioned earlier. That was a part of Omnibus Season. Yes. Vince McMahon, Vince McMahon stories. And some of the stories you have told on the show previously were about you and various other people at his house, at his pool, at his kitchen table. Yes. And news broke this week, and everyone just love to talk about this story that Vince McMahon's house was going for sale in Greenwich, Connecticut for $32 million. Yes. What are and your I thoughts? saw that. I saw that as well. And immediately I said, wait a minute, I got to see how they're listing this and maybe see some pictures of the old place. And, you know, remember when Pat Patterson would hide behind those bushes and I impersonate one of the landscapers or when I got pushed in the pool or when, Bruce took a horrible, stinky shit in the guest bathroom right inside the front door in the front hallway there, and you could smell it all the way back in the dining room. What? I'll relive some memories. And I clicked, I, but I, I'm at the same time, I was like, I knew this joint was big. And, and it was impressive to my untrained eyes who had not spent a lot of time in Greenwich mansions at that point in my life. But I didn't know it was worth $32 million even today, right? So I clicked on that 
real estate listing. And I started looking at those pictures and I'm like, I don't recognize the old place at all. <laughs> Has he, well, he certainly changed something. Well, wait a minute. And then I realized, wait a minute, it's the same house. And apparently somebody in a later article or listing or some talk about this, they've mentioned that this is a house that he put, that he bought in 2014, which obviously is more recent than the late nineties. The last time I hung out by Vince's pool, but I was looking at the map because the real estate listing obviously has the, the map there. And apparently he bought a house that's just uh, around the corner and down the bend for this neighborhood from the house that I spent time in. He still lives. It's like the next road over. You can't even say street. These are these, these places have 10, 12, 15, 20 or more acres in this area. And it's heavily wooded. And so you don't really see. I'm, I haven't been to every house in the fucking, you know, in the development. I can't call it a develop in the in the neighborhood. But uh, you can't really even see your next door neighbors. So this house apparently is down the and around the bend from the one that he had before. And it's much more massive. It's bigger. It. I saw the aerial picture. There's a lot more. A lot more shit going on at this place, even than the last one he had, which was pretty daggum impressive. And I guess he had lived in that uh, house since, geez, the at least the 80s, I guess. Well, yeah, he, he wouldn't have had it before the 80s, but um, he had been there for a while at that point. Remember, I, and I don't know if it was on the on the bus episode, but I, I've mentioned this in public before. He lived in the same neighborhood it's a gated community uh but yeah like i said you can't really call it a community when you've got you know 15 20 acres around you and the next door neighbors um but it was the same gated community as ron howard opie taylor on the andy griffith show also uh, you know minor director of minor movies right ron howard he's probably got a couple of dollars um and you had to when you turned off the main road into Vince's neighborhood, you had to go through a guard shack and you had to show them your papers. Either tell them, hey, I'm going to, obviously they knew the residents, but if if you weren't a resident, you had to say, I'm going to so-and-so's house and they had to check and see if you were on the list. And if you weren't on the list, they had to call the house and get the okay before they'd let you in the fucking neighborhood. Not in Vince's own driveway but just anywhere in the neighborhood and so me and bruce and later on shit stain um you know we were on the standing wednesday morning list or whatever and you know you got to know the guard but i would pull up there in that beat up old uh i, I still had the taurus when i first moved up there and that beat up ford taurus i had and it looked like you know shit the neighborhood right but uh, the guard was very friendly. But point being, he had, a, a, you know, there's apparently another house that was bigger, an upgrade came on the market in the same area. What is it, Conyers Farm or whatever? And so he, he upgraded a while back. And now he's selling. I don't know where he's going now. Where, where would, would is he going to, is he going to get a bigger mansion than this or do you think he's going to downsize now that he's entering his his golden years this is the end <laughs> beautiful friend the end i think um look he's downsizing when has vince mcmahon ever downsized anything i've never known it to happen linda's already living her own life in florida vince has a place in florida I don't know. Who knows what's going on? He doesn't look. Like I heard. I heard not, I, a long time ago that he also had a penthouse in in Manhattan of some description or some high highfalutin apartment there in Manhattan. For when you know, oh, I'd pay to see that he was in the city for business or whatever the case, or maybe it was in Stamford. I don't know if he's near the office. He might. He ought to just buy Connecticut. Just buy Connecticut. Run a few people off and make the rest of them the. The gardeners and the landscapers and the housemates he's, and things. He's not even the richest guy in Greenwich. What do you buy Connecticut? Whoa, he's got a credit card, though. 
Fuck, he can, he can make some time payments. He's never going to retire. But he has a history of reneging on a deal and just saying tough. Yeah. And then how you how you going to fucking repossess Connecticut? That would be a trick. Once he once he gets in there, he'd be like a squatter. And then, you know, would they would the state government have 90 days to kick him out of Connecticut if he didn't, you know, make all the payments? You know, it, 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 McDivitt could fucking branch that out into six, eight months at least. And then, you, and you know, man, 70 something years old, you're getting close to a, a ticking clock there. I think if he bought Connecticut on credit, he could live there the rest of his life before they figured out a way to get him he out. He doesn't have enough money or enough credit to buy anything like that. So let's get out of that. But I think maybe he's going to get a room in <laughs> Stephanie and Paul's house. Like the grandkids get to grow up with crazy grandpa Vince in the house and you know they help him brush his teeth and everything else I thought you just get a room I didn't even know you were going at Stephanie and <laughs> I didn't mean get a room just get a room well no here and <laughs> hey here's the thing when Shane got married and I don't know what, what he did for Stephanie maybe he bought her Rhode Island or New Hampshire or whatever that the fucking state is up there the little postage stamp state they live in but on, at Vince's old place the, in Greenwich, the house I was talking about, there was a an a building, a structure. If you went out, you know, back past Vince's pool and looked down way in the woods and everything, there was a sizable building that apparently had been like a three-car garage with maybe even servants' quarters on top, that type of thing. It was the size of a you know, two bedroom house with two floors and you know, it hadn't been used, I guess, or it was, you know, still its original purpose, a garage or whatever. And when Shane got married, Vince had that re renovated, re renovated, that's fucking English, had it renovated and gave it to him and Marissa as a wedding present. So he could live down the hill for a while there. I'm just obviously, yeah, what a gift. Was, well, no, I was. I get to supervise you forever. Yeah. Ah. I'm looking down on you, Shane. But that was 25 <laughs> years ago. The man's made a lot of money since then. He's moved out, but he spent. And this was again 25 years ago. And this is not conjecture because on one of my trips into the kitchen to get a goddamn cold drink out of the refrigerator, there was the uh, construction bill laying on the counter, exposed for all the world to see. He spent like 120, 130 grand on just renovating this, this, it was probably nicer than most places that people lived to begin with, but he spent that money to renovate it. So it would be suitable for a wedding present. I'm like, Jesus Christ, $125,000 or whatever for a wedding present. Maybe he could adopt me. But then I realized I'd have to live there too. And then I'd be on working all the time. Go ahead. Vince and his family have always said, that whatever they do, whatever they ask talent to do, it's always what's best for business. It later became an on-air thing, but it was a reality behind the scenes. It's all about what's best for business. And I think that should apply here. And whatever Vince is going to do, wherever he's going to move, there should be a film crew on him 24-7 <laughs> right now. This is the reality show that America needs. Vince McMahon house hunting. And then living somewhere and just watch him live. <laughs> Everyone's fascinated by what a crazy guy this is. What does he do in his spare time? It's what's best for business. It would be the most watched show WWE could produce right now. I want to see the move. Also, and, and, and see exactly how he, if he would arrange the things himself or if he'd have it done and then he'd critique it afterwards or whatever the case may be. Did the he have possessions in his house that were like cherished? Like, for me, like, my library's a big deal. I love my books. Yeah. Did he have, like, actual possessions that he cared about or anything that, that he exhibited <laughs> he to you? he cared about? Yes. No, I don't well, know. To yes, me, it seems like a guy that just wouldn't give a shit about, like, any actual possessions. No, I don't know he why. had possessions that he cared about. There was the aforementioned Rhode Island. He, You know, he used to <laughs> like that place. He doesn't get up there anymore. No. Um, I mean, it was a typical mansion with mansion like furniture in it in most places but he did off of it you would you walked in the door and to the left was the infamous 
dining room after uh, this big entry hall and the aforementioned guest bathroom and etc and then you kind of went into a another big sitting room area and on the left was the dining room that was right off of the kitchen and on the right he had a private office den office whatever I, you know every once in a while you would go in there but not obviously alone if that's where he had his vcr hooked up if he had to watch something and a fax machine back there and that's where he'd go back and take calls with brett and sean whining at each other but i was back in there and he had books on the shelves and a nice desk and family pictures and i didn't ask him you know the goddamn backstory behind every furnishing but it looked like an an older rich white guy's office with statuary and things that who has you know, no interest in anything that's happening yes. in the real world well I, there wasn't a lot of the real world in there no but but it was his world and he was welcome to it remember that william Wyndham, early 1970s my world and welcome to it like there was no jim i want to show you this is my baseball card collection i kept this oh, in God, a shoebox no, in never, a trailer no, when i was a kid None of no, that. No, I, that was not anything like that. Well, but that would have required us to go over and just visit and just be talking about shit that wasn't related to what was going to be on the USA Network that following Monday night, and he never really does that. It, and I would say maybe in the car, but at the same time in the car, he's always got his fucking notepad open and going over the formats. So there was not a lot of baseball cards showing off there. Right. He did. He did get. He get. He got upset. Well, Bruce used to tell it because you know Bruce didn't like Jerry Jarrett because when Jerry Jarrett went up there, he he treated Vince and Pat with deferential respect and treated Bruce like fucking office boy. But Bruce always liked to tell a story of when Ron Howard brought his kids trick or treating one Halloween. They were up there. It had to be ninety two or ninety three or whatever. But he comes to the door, and Jerry Jarrett's sitting back, and he. He looked and he saw who it was. He said, well, that's Opie Taylor, like Jerry Jarrett talks, because he's from the South. Well, then, of course, Bruce tries to do impersonations of people. Well, he said, well, there's Opie Taylor. Opie Taylor. Well, Jerry Jarrett didn't run up to the guy screaming, you're Opie Taylor, and ask for his autograph. But in Bruce's <laughs> fucking rendition of the, the story he did. So one time I'm going over there on a Wednesday to write TV, and I have stopped and I'm second in line at the guard shack. And the first guy gets out of the car because he goes over and he collects a package from the, the guard shack there and puts it back in his car, and it's Ron Howard. So on the way, then you have to drive another couple miles to get back to Vince's house. So on the way down the road, I said, oh, I got to do this. So I, when I got there, Vince was in the bathroom or whatever, and real quick, I got my briefcase, and I got a piece of paper, and I wrote, Ron and then scratched it out and wrote Opie Taylor in kind of goofy handwriting. And when Vince came in, I said, Vince, you're never going to believe who I saw at the guard shack. He's who, who's that? He's already trepidatious, right? I said, I saw Ron Howard, Ron Howard, the director, Ron Howard. Well, yes, pal. Yeah. He lives down the road. And he didn't know that Bruce was telling his Jerry Jerry story. So, he lives down the road. Yeah, I saw him, and I, I got out, and I asked for his autograph, and you should have, then the mortification starts coming on. Vince is for you, did? And then I said, yeah, look, and I held that piece of paper out. He, I said he started to write Ron Howard, but then I told him, I said, no, no, if we would write Opie Taylor, <laughs> and he was nice enough to do that. He gave me a weird look, and he got back in his car, but I guess he figured, you know, he looked at my car. I didn't belong here, but I told him I was coming to see you because I was a I was working for you, and I'm here every week. <laughs> His fucking eyes lit. You did? And we had to tell him. Unfortunately, we had to, because I was afraid he was going to fucking call Ron Howard and apologize. It was, you had to be there. What did he say when you told him? Well, then he laughed. Then he, then he got the rib, and he thought it was funny. So you can rib Vince. Yo, yeah, that just something like the yeah. No, he thought it was funny after that, but at, at first he thought, oh my God, this fucking. He asked Ron Howard to sign an autograph at the guard shack for Opie, of Opie Taylor and then told him he was coming to my house. So I don't know. Maybe he would have called and apologized like fucking Stu Hart called and yelled at Bruce when I told Stu that Bruce was that the sexual deviant and everything. But that's a different story for another day. What'd you do for Christmas? 
Uh, I hung out at home. Family here. Suzanne has a lot of family over. So I uh, naturally was hiding in the office for most of, <laughs> most of the day. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, you know, I did a lot of selfish stuff. Worked on a jigsaw puzzle, listened to some music, did some reading, did some work. The good stuff. And then hung out with the family, all that shit. I was always, uh, did you manage to walk through the kitchen and say hello to the family once or twice? For heaven's sake. Well, I'll, I'll have you know. We had Colombian food. It was delicious. Colombian food? From Noches de Colombia, yes. Do they have Christmas in Colombia? Yeah, of course they have Christmas in Colombia. I'll tell you what we did around here, unlike you. Yeah. We had quality family time here, me, Stacy, and Harley Quinn. What does that mean? You fried a turkey? No, we didn't. No, and we had that shipped in for Thanksgiving. No, this time, because I've mentioned that it's now been 22 months that I have uh, only been in one restaurant, right? 22 months, because the last time was the end of February of 2020. So, I've mentioned we've been getting tired of the delivery food because it, especially when it, it's going to be 15, 20 minutes from its destination, it loses, just like your bubble gum loses some of its flavor on the bedpost overnight, so the delivery food, by the time it leaves the kitchen and gets to your house, so we got a little tired of that. And, you know, we've cooked all the things that we know how to cook over and over again, so Stacy had the idea for the holidays we're going to have a different variety of foods shipped in, but that we can still cook here at home. I'll have you know. So. That's cool. One night, we had actual lobster from Maine combined with our Omaha Steaks bacon wrap filet mignons. And I was all for the lobster until I realized, and the way I realized this was they showed up and I heard them moving around that they were still living in this styrofoam box with the ice packs and everything. And I'm so she had to cook those because I don't deal with anything that's still moving around. And I understand that's how they do it, but I've never actually gone to the time and trouble of meeting my lobster dinner before the inevitable took place, but it was good. And then on another occasion, we had crab cakes from Maryland, not cooked and frozen, but just sent fresh to us, and we cooked them right in the in the oven and paired those with some ribeyes. On another day, we had these bacon-wrapped shrimp, and I can't remember where she got that from. Um, we had several different kinds of... They were bringing packages of food for a while there, Christmas week, but the main event... The piece de resistance, or I should say the pizza de resistance, homemade Emo's pizza, Brian Last, homemade Emo's in Louisville, not St. Louis. Ask me how I did it. How did you do it? I'll tell you how I'd like to hear it. Here it goes. They sell the Provel cheese, and they also, uh, a fan a beloved, wonderful fan whose name has been lost to history a couple of months ago sent me a, for my birthday, I think it was, sent me a gift box of uh, uh, Emo's pizza sauce and salad dressing. And I hadn't used the pizza sauce because I was meaning to get some of the cheese. Well, Stacy did it for me. Six pounds of Provel cheese in eight ounce containers. And we got a, a fresh pizza crust from Papa Murphy's over here because his crust is crust. And spread the Emo's pizza sauce on, and I browned some Jimmy Dean sausage, and we put some green peppers and some onions on that thing and covered it with a heaping helping of that Provel cheese that is the gooeyest, meltiest cheese in the world, and I'm so tasty, and baked a homemade Emo's pizza and... I got most of it. She got what she could wrestle away from me. But that was that was for Christmas Eve. We had Emo's Eve. You don't sound impressed. Now, we had a real pizza, not that kind of cardboard, lack of toppings, 
generic stuff that y'all wheel out there up in New York. We had real St. Louis pizza. You have never spoken of this Emo's pizza and had it sound appealing to me in any way. It sounds disgusting. Oh. And I, and I want nothing to do with it. Well, I And we have the best pizza in the any. world and it's recognized by everyone. Everyone. Yeah, New York, people. New Jersey, Long Island. I mean, that's it. Well, that doesn't take into account St. Louis or the great, greater metropolitan Louisville area. No, it takes into account St. Louis and the greater metropolitan Louisville yeah. area. It just doesn't rank them. It doesn't rank them because that stuff that you sell up there in those little kiosks, what do they call them? Bodegas. We don't sell pizza. I don't know where you're getting a pizza in a bodega. It's all those little those little slummy storefronts with exhaust fumes belching in the front door from all those trucks and buses and taxis that you got up there. Gets all over the, the, the crust. That's why all the crust looks positively brown and muddy what? we've got pure crust up here <laughs> and can you think of all the toxins word. the airborne <laughs> toxins that are infiltrating all those new york pizza places and then not to mention the people hurrying and scurrying in and out the door all the time bringing in pathogens buying pizza and buying pizza well they call it pizza and spreading their their disease and their pestilence everywhere. I'm surprised the whole thing is not a, a Petri dish for the next pandemic of New York pizza places. You know, real quick, as I'm trying to understand this bizarre pizza palette you have, pizza pa you've never, I don't believe, you've never spoken on the show about your early days with pizza. Was there a pizza shop in Louisville when you were growing up? When did you first start eating pizza? Did you like it early on? Did you have any issues like with an ice cream cone where you didn't want to touch it because you were going to eat it and your hand touched it? Talk about. No. Please talk about your experiences with pizza in the early years. Well, I had no experience with pizza really in the early years because nobody, nobody, no how delivered any type of food out here to the castle in those days as far out as we were. So there was no call dominoes or whatever. And there were Pizza Hut and Pizza Inn, and I had obviously had pizza, uh, but there was not really any specialty shops uh, for pizza back then, except for a few of the major chains. Um, there was uh, one place that a friend of my cousin's used to to run that was a, a, a kind of a homemade, uh, not a chain Italian place. They had pizza and all kinds of things like that. We would go there every once in a while. But pizza wasn't a big deal back then. But around about the late 70s, when I started going to Evansville, that's when, as I mentioned this place, we started going to the Rocka Bar there in Evansville. All the people in Evansville and that surrounding area know what I'm talking about. They, they got two locations, but the original one has been there since the 60s probably. And uh, that's where we would go after the matches to get something to eat before we came back to Louisville. And Miss Jarrett and whoever was driving her went back to Nashville. We'd stop there and they would keep uh, part of the dining room open for us a little bit late because they knew we were coming from the matches. And that was incredible pizza. So what I started doing was I started getting one there. And then back then, a fucking large pizza from this place was like six bucks or whatever. So I'd get three of them pre-cooked where they weren't cooked all the way. They'd wrap them up and I would take them home, put them in the freezer. And then when I got back in from whatever show we might've gone to, I would stick one in the oven and I'd have two or three more before the next week when we would go back to Evansville and I'd get some more. An old man named Casalavecchio owned the place and, and he may ground his own sausage and lovingly formed his own pizzas and put them in the oven himself. And they were just, and every piece, because they cut, they didn't cut them in those big slices like you crazy people up there, and then they flop everywhere. They cut them in squares like normal people do down here. Oh, in, give me a fucking break. In St. Louis oh, and most, Louisville. Oh, no, no, no. And I'm not letting you get away with this. No. And every square had this beautiful sausage ball sitting oh, on top of it. They were evenly placed with love by hand. They were, they were amazing.
Look, Sicilian and then pizza. I've loved pizza ever since. Sicilian pizza is wonderful, especially when it has enough sauce, which is a problem with some of the places out there, to be honest. Grandma pizza is fantastic. Grandma pizza. It's a, I'm not even going to try to explain it to you because we, we have, a again, different pizza palettes yeah. here. Yeah. However, pizza done best is a circle or even something that kind of resembles a circle. If we're really going to talk no, about some of the artisans. It's a circle, but you cut, cut square, it in square sizes. That's, no, 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 no. It has to, triangles. You get crust, sauce, cheese into a triangle. But the best pieces are the ones in the middle where you got no crust on the edge and you can eat the whole thing. You don't want any crust? No. Why wouldn't you want crust? It's delicious. The crust is only there to hold up the cheese and the toppings. I never, I'm like, you, you, to me to tell me that you eat the naked crust around the ring, around the outside of the pizza. That's like a pizza bone. You eat everything up to the edge of the crust there and then leave that, the pizza bone on the plate. No, that's the part where you're hopeful in a perfect world with a good pizza place. There's enough sauce near the rim, near the barrier that you can eat some of that crust that remains with the sauce. So it's not just the bone of the pizza, as you put it. But yeah, I eat the whole slice. When I get a slice, see, maybe this is the problem. You've <sighs> never had pizza good enough no, no, to no, eat no, the no. entire slice. No, no, no. What the fuck's the matter with you? I've had plenty of good pizza, but there's no reason to eat just cooked dough. You don't, I mean, well, you eat the pizza. I was going to say, you don't just like take the cheese and the sauce off the top and leave the no, bottom. No, you eat all of them together. But the the ring, that's what you hold on to is, is the crust around it's the edge. There's no on toppings to. on. That's the handle. That's the bone of it. You're like, you're like you're eating a chicken leg. You eat the meat off and put the bone down on the plate. Well, you eat the, the meat and the, the toppings and the goodness off the pizza and you put the crust down, the bone. On the plate. Don't you know well, these things, Brian? I, I disagree, but let me ask you a question. I'm curious, because I know you've liked Domino's in the past, especially when you were on the road. Well, I didn't say I, didn't say I liked it. I just You it, ate it. It was, it was available on right. the road, yes. Late at night, you're in your hotel room, you could still get yes. Domino's. One, probably one of the reasons I've had such problems with acid reflux after that. And one of the great things about Domino's is when you are in that moment of desperation where you're ready for Domino's. It's the most delicious thing you'll ever have when it's fresh. Yeah, because you're you're starving and it's the only thing available. And the bread is good to the point where they started selling breadsticks and cinnamon bread and all these different bread combinations. So that's a little different than the average pizza bread because Domino's is different than the average pizza. Do you eat that bread? Well, you're talking about the breadsticks? The crust. No, the crust. The crust of that pizza, of Domino's pizza. Do you eat no, that? No, I don't eat the crust of any pizza. Wow. Because that's the handle. <laughs> by which you lift the slice of pizza to your mouth and, and eat it all the way down to the nub. So what do you do when you get a square slice with nothing to hold on to, as you put it? Well, then that's even extra good because you get to eat the whole thing and that's where it's thickest and you get the most cheese and meat, which is, after all, why you're there and to begin with. Cheese and meat. Or meat with extra cheese. Well, Jim, I have to ask after... I'm not even going to go any further with the pizza stuff right now because this could turn into a whole show. I may, I may like. not talk to you anymore if you keep up. But let me ask you this. Considering all this that you said that you ate, including making your own Emo's pizza, did you gain weight? I mean, you've been losing weight. You've been in such great shape. Everyone saw that video of you and was raving about how good you looked. And now you ate all this. What happened? Yes. Well, that's because for the first time in my life, Brian, last, I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, Jim, you could stand to gain a few pounds. And that's what I decided to do. I decided <laughs> to gain a few pounds over Christmas. No, over the last six or eight weeks, honestly, besides the fact that the weather's turned colder, I don't even sweat when I'm trucking that stuff into the post office or out in the garage or feeding the deer with the wheelbarrow in the back. I haven't sweated. I've been tired a lot of times at, in the evening after filling orders for eight or 10 hours. I would, uh, I'm just going to have a sandwich and lay down, whatever. And I got down to 195 pounds from my former base weight of between 200 and 205. And I say, you know what? I got five pounds to play with here. So it's not often I can say that. So I have been, I've also, I didn't even talk about the dessert. Stace got me a cake. 
she got me uh, white fudge covered Oreos and also a Patty LaBelle Nanner pudding, which I'm still working on because I'm saving that for special occasions like nighttime. But a Patty LaBelle Nanner pudding, so I've been on the and and some strawberry cheesecake ice cream. So I've been alternating those also. So I've I've got back up to 199, I'll have you know. I'm in shape, baby. All right. Well, what do you got? Hey, we we were doing a programming plug about 30 minutes ago. I was gonna say though, now that you're in shape, you gotta stay in shape. Oh, I see what you're going for there. You're thinking now. Now's the time. Well, now that he's just a fat fuck. <laughs> Now that he just can't wear any of his clothes, now he's got to start exercising. Well, I'll tell you what. I don't know if it's come to that drastic of a point yet, but I'll guarantee you one thing. I know where to go if I want to exercise, if I want to work out, if I want to get in shape. Echelon. Our friends at Echelon got you covered coming and going, folks. Whether you're trying to reach your fitness goals, trying to work out, trying to feel better, They've got you covered on the equipment, the instruction, and the people to egg you on and give you that extra push and potentially punish you if you don't meet your goals. Because we got to run a tight ship here, folks. But Echelon it has world-class instructors like Nicole Griffin. She was married at one time to Peter Griffin before Lois and also Michael Brown. But they choreograph classes with music from your favorite artists. And you've got a community, like I said, of hundreds of thousands of people who can give you that extra push, and they all live in your immediate vicinity. They'll be knocking on your door if you don't follow through with things, folks. Anyway, Echelon is the affordable way to get the workout equipment, the workout community, and an instructor's motivation right in the comfort of your own home. They've got thousands of live and on-demand classes with great music, with Echelon, you can work out anytime, day or night, and crush your fitness goals. Well, you got to be strong to crush stuff. So work on your hands first. Just pick your class. Climb the leaderboard, which we've mentioned is a challenge in itself. That fucking leaderboard, it's high and it's steep. But you can cheer each other on and give it your all with Echelon certified fitness instructors who are supportive, engaging, and fun. But you don't have to get engaged to any of them if you're already married. They'll just help you work out. Also, Echelon has a full range of affordable workout equipment, including stationary bikes. Don't expect to get anywhere, but they will give you good exercise. Smart rowers. People will come to your home, put you in a boat, and row you around the lake. And they're smart enough to get you back home. You're not going to disagree with me about any of this shit today, are you? They've got sleek fitness screens. And the ever-popular and highly addictive auto-folding treadmill. It folds up by itself. Safely. Whenever it wants to. Just Sa safely. Not whenever it wants to. No, 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 no. No? As directed by the user. As directed by the user, this will fold up by itself once you give it the word. And boy, the way they're making these smart things these days. Just don't tell it your bank account numbers or personal information. Don't talk to the treadmill, just instruct it on what to do every once in a while. But they're all connected. All these items, all these pieces of equipment are connected to provide the Echelon experience, which includes around-the-clock classes for the family with full-body workout programs. From your nose to your toes, it'll make your knees freeze, your liver quiver, and your spleen turn green. It'll keep you coming back for more. One membership covers a family of five. If you do not have five people in your family, they encourage you to start procreating immediately to get your money's worth. <laughs> but right now, for a limited time only, folks, my listeners can get up to $800 off the MSRP. And you can also get $800 off some of this fitness equipment. If you text the word DRIVE to 818181, that's an exclusive discount for our listeners. Text DRIVE to 818181 and get up to $800 off. Message and data rates may apply. See terms for details. You know, they say you have these classes 
with your favorite music. What is your favorite music's Mozart? Are there any well, classes he, for that? He wrote some upbeat shit, right? And especially with those bass drums and all the, you know, the various symphony pipe organs they had back in those days. It's some heavy shit. It's biblical. I think I could work out to some of it, but there are there actual classes for classical <laughs> music fans? So you can ride your bike listening to Beethoven, Bach. I, they said Handel. music from your favorite artists. Interesting. And it may, maybe even Vincent van Gogh. Pablo Picasso, all your favorite artists. I don't know what they sounded like singing. It, I, I would actually like some Love and Spoonful. If, could we play the Love and Spoonful's greatest hits while I am on my stationary bike? There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I guess you can, I could see you, you know, the idea of you riding your bike to, do you believe in magic is pretty fucking funny. If you really yeah, in a young girl's it. heart. All right. And, and it's, it, you know, it, the thing is, they mislabel these things stationary bike sauce because I got one a long time ago and it didn't do me any good at all. So I sold it. And after I sold it, the guy that bought it from me said, Oh, I love it. I said, Well, I really didn't get any use out of it. And he said, Well, you know, what, how were you, what were you doing? And I said, Well, you know, I got on it and it said a stationary bike and it, it never went anywhere. He said, Well, how fast were you pedaling? I said, I didn't know you had to pedal because it said it was stationary. And, it, and there weren't any wheels on it. So I just sat there, and it, it, it chaffed my taint. All right. Anyway. Well, it's my show, sadly. But, but, you know, I got a story, because another thing that I did over Christmas was I got the chance, actually, I don't know what to do when I don't have something to do. It's such an odd feeling, because it happens so infrequently. But I was able to catch up with a few people on the phone, and I talked to Bobby Fulton, who had a complete shoulder replacement. Um, what was it? The 22nd, I think of December. And as of Christmas day, he was still in the hospital, but they're hoping to let him go fairly soon. And he's feeling as good as can be expected. But he mentioned to me, and this was, I had, he had told me this years ago, but I, I don't think I've told it because I hadn't thought of it in ages. He reminded me of it. Because, you know, Bobby moved back to his hometown, Chillicothe, Ohio. That's where he's from. And he's been back living there for a number of years now. And Chillicothe's not like a, a big city. So, you know, the point is, Bobby has friends that know him as a wrestler, but they're not necessarily wrestling fans or in the wrestling business. They're just from the same hometown, and they know that Bobby Fulton is the most famous pro wrestler ever from Chillicothe, right? But they've been friends just because they were hometown friends. God, I say that because a lot of times people think everybody in the wrestling business, the only friends you have are in the wrestling business. That's the only people you know, whatever. So this friend of Bobby's, he has apparently been to Bobby's house. He may have been to one or two of the shows that Bobby runs there. Just saw oh, he's seen the wrestling, but he doesn't really know much about anything or anybody in, in the business. And he works up there at a company. Well, apparently. They were, him and his uh, work group, and he mentioned to Bobby, yeah, we're going to Atlanta for a work trip. And I guess from having been at Bobby's house or whatever, he was cognizant, his friend was, of the fact that Bobby knew a professional wrestler in Atlanta that at that time had a restaurant. And come find out it was Abdullah, Abdullah the Butcher. Oh, boy. Yeah. So with no real knowledge otherwise than Bobby Fulton's friend telling his work group who don't know shit from apple butter about the wrestling business or anybody in it. Hey, a friend of mine from here at Chillicothe, he's, he's a wrestler and he knows a wrestler that owns a restaurant in Atlanta. While we're down there on our trip, we ought to go. And of course, on the surface of it, not knowing any of the particulars, that sounds like a frolicsome adventure while they're on the business trip, right? So they end up going to Abdullah the Butcher's house of ribs and Chinese food. Was that the official title? I believe so. Or was it so. house of chicken ribs and Chinese food? Oh, now I'm not sure. It may have been, but he had everything covered. And a lot of people, I mean, the wrestling fans have gone there. And from the, I never went, but from the pictures, it seemed to be or like a combination of like a cafeteria type setting and the tables with the checkered tablecloth you might see at a soul food place or whatever. 
<clears throat> it was not is not a four star sit down dining establishment with white linen tablecloths and whatever, right? So already they walk in and they look at the place and they're standing there and apparently, because this was several years ago before he closed the place, but Abby used to spend some time there. Abby walks in and apparently Bobby's friend had related to whoever was behind the cash register that he was a friend of another pro wrestler named Bobby Fulton and Bobby has booked Abby a lot over the last 15, 20 years on shows he runs. So. Abby comes over to him and says, oh, no, you guys, come here, private dining room. So he takes them in the back, and they're thinking, okay, maybe this wasn't as, as bad as we feared it might. The owner, you know, uh, this large African-American gentleman, he was probably wearing his cap so they couldn't see the gig marks on his head. At least he's put us in a private dining room. We're going to get the best experience they've got to offer here, right? So they order their food. And then the food is coming, and as a special treat, guess what a Abby does? I don't know. He turns on the TV monitors in the private dining room and puts on video of his matches in Puerto Rico. <laughs> oh, my God. Those are the bloodiest matches he had. <laughs> yes. And so there, these people who know absolutely nothing about fucking wrestling <laughs> or who this fucking guy is, otherwise that they've been suggested to come to this place, they're eating barbecue and Chinese food while there's pictures of this 400 pound African American man with gig marks. You can lay pencils and stick poker chips in, in his forehead, stabbing other wrestlers in the head with various sharp <laughs> objects. I bloods flying everywhere. And Bobby said to guys said one by one, you can see them put their forks down. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe that's uh, an insight. You got it. You had to be a wrestling fan to fully appreciate all the wonders that Abdullah, the butcher's house of chicken ribs and Chinese food presented you. You know what young wrestling fans today are going to lose that we had? I mean, you had, and obviously you and I are different generations, but but you and I both had it. I learned geography from wrestling. Yes. Because everyone had a hometown, different areas had big arenas. Pro wrestling at a young age, nine, ten years old, taught me everything I ever needed to know about geography. And because they don't announce hometowns as much, because every arena looks exactly the same. Yeah. I feel like wrestling for young wrestling fans today aren't going to have the wonderful learning environment that we had <laughs> watching it on well, TV. Well, no, on, honestly, you know, if you were a wrestling fan, if just in the days of the magazines, even before video or whatever, you knew the names of the arenas in all these major cities. And, you know, even when I was just a photographer before I started, you know, in the, in the business full time. I was making trips and also I would I would look at the atlas or the map to see where such and such, you know, uh, the home seat of whatever territory was and then when I got in the business, I constantly like a a book would read the Rand McNally Road Atlas not only to figure out where we were going but also then you're stuck in a car, there wasn't all this bullshit now, you didn't even have satellite radio back then. So I spent a lot of time in the back seat of the car reading the atlas. Trying to, okay, I see now how the guys made the trip in this particular territory and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I may be, I may not be real strong on the Dakotas and Montana, but I can get you almost anywhere else in this country by just memory. Is that what you wanted to know? It's not what I wanted to know. It was just an observation how, you know, back when I was watching TV as a kid, even the job guys at hometowns. And now no one has a hometown. Just, here is this person. Well, you know, honestly, that's another of those things that is, I've just glossed over in my head. I didn't realize till you said that. Yeah, they ain't announcing hometowns anymore, for the most part. Some people get them, some people don't. I mean, each company does things differently, but you don't always hear them. But, geez, when I was a kid, why did I know Stone Mountain, Georgia? Why did a little Jewish kid in Long Island know Stone Mountain, Georgia? Because Jake Cause the Snake Because of Crusher Roberts. Blackwell. Well, Jake the Snake. Again, I was in the Northeast. Oh, okay. But that's the point. You knew different towns, and now, I don't know. Not so much, but... We now begin part two of Jim Cornette's drive through here this week. Just tell the people you had to piss and get it over with. 
Well, I think both of us asked for a short break. I don't going. recall speaking up. I was just cut off in unceremoniously. When I was about to mention, you've just given up on this program. When I was about to mention that we're going to, we're your program next week, the drive through all new again, and we're actually going to make the sacrifice and talk about the WWE pay-per-view in Atlanta with Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns in the main event that we want to see that isn't on the Royal Rumble or isn't on WrestleMania. It's on New Year's Day, a pay-per-view for the first time ever. Is this either a brilliant marketing ploy to get people to watch a pay-per-view on New Year's Day for the first time ever, or are they wasting the biggest match that they can put together? Possibly both. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's an interesting concept, the idea of running wrestling on January 1st doing a big show when people are typically home, but you're giving away what I think is clearly their biggest match on an event. No one has heard of before. That's never been established. You, like you said, you have Royal rumble right around the corner. I don't know what WrestleMania will be. That will have any real interest other than the brand WrestleMania. And I'm, I'm a feared that they're going to try some kind of three way to throw Brock and reigns in with somebody else. And it, then you nullify the reason why Brock Lesnar is special because in a three way, it's obviously phony and, and it's a rehash at this point because there's so many three ways, but new year's day for wrestling is not a new concept, but for a pay-per-view it is. Uh, but for an, and Atlanta on new year's day is not hold on one second. I'm I've got the midnight express book here in front of me. Because I think it was 86 and 87, was it not? Uh, hold on. <clears throat> yes. We were in Atlanta on Christmas night in the Omni at 8 o'clock Christmas night, uh, 1986. And that was the annual fan appreciation night they would do on a Christmas holiday. Um, that afternoon we did Greenville, South Carolina, and the tickets were three dollars fan appreciation night. And we only did ten thousand seven hundred dollars at three dollar tickets, uh, because the previous year I think we sold out. Nevertheless, uh then we went to the Omni and did eighty thousand dollars at five dollar tickets, sixteen thousand people that night. And then one week later came back on New Year's night in the Omni. And with regular prices and drew another 6,000 people paying $55,000. So in seven days time, there were two shows in the Omni that drew 22,000 people and grossed $135,000. What were the main events? Were they big main events like a Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar? Well, I do not have the card since this is the Midnight Express scrapbook. I can go to, we can take another break and I can go get in the vault, but I will tell you that we... Uh, worked with uh, Armstrong and Horner on the fan appreciation. They didn't waste big matches for the fan appreciation because it's three and five dollar tickets. Uh, I think on January first, it was probably Dusty and Flair doing something with uh, let's off of Starcade. So if that was the case, it might have been Flair and Nikita and Dusty doing something with Tully, but. The Midnight and Bubba were in a six-man with the Road Warriors and Paul Ellering. So, and then there was a bunkhouse stampede, which Big Bubba won. So, the January 1st was a big card. The fan appreciation, you just got to go re to wrestling on a holiday for cheap and get away from your house. Because those were the days where no restaurant was open except for Waffle House. Nothing was going on. You either went to wrestling or went to a fucking movie, if they were open. Why do you think January 1st never took off like a Thanksgiving day or a Christmas day for wrestling? Well, because for one thing, it was so close behind Christmas. Because That's true, Christmas, yeah. Yeah, later. I mean, it, it, Atlanta was doing good business at that time. That's why they, you know, made that step. But a lot of places, unless it was a weekly territory to begin with, and the weekly territories, if you'll notice, Memphis, Continental, you know, et cetera, they didn't do big shows because 
for the most part, I mean, every once in a while you get the world champion in or whatever, but they didn't do big shows that were constructed as big annual shows because they were there 52 times a year. So, you know, it, it was, it was hard. That's why January 1st coming right after Christmas and Christmas and Thanksgiving were the two biggest days of the year. So it just didn't take on in a lot of, pl although believe it or not, the only time I ever worked on new year's Eve was the, the first week we spent in mid South wrestling. And we were booked in Oklahoma city. That was the first time we ever went to Oak city. And I saw that. I'm like, New Year's Eve? What the fuck? There's not going to be anybody there. We got there. Guess what the fuck and how? Well, hold on. You don't have to guess. I will. Well, you can guess in a minute when I tell you exactly, because I can't remember the exact figure, but I will go to this. But guess what the fucking house was on December 31st, 1983 in um, fucking uh, Oklahoma City. Okay, that's not exactly, that's the end of the down period of Mid-South Wrestling, but it is the holiday time. I don't know. Why don't you, why don't you tell me what it was? Why don't you just write it off? $65,000, and at ticket prices back then, that was somewhere around 6,000 people on New Year's Eve. I couldn't, it was the, I'd worked in front of more people in a big house in Memphis because the Coliseum seated almost 11,000. I'd been there for at least one sellout in a couple of big houses. But a sellout in Memphis in those days for 11,000 people was a, a, almost 50 grand. So this was the biggest house I'd ever worked on in a down period for the territory. And we were in a preliminary. I'm like, holy shit, what can we do here? And we found out. Later on, at the, we got a hundred and whatever three thousand dollars or whatever in the myriad um, when we sold it out. It was so that was an incredible surprise to me. I would have never thought New Year's Eve, but I've never seen it happen anywhere else. So there you have it. Well, speaking of wrestling during the holidays, we do have lots of questions to get to, but let's talk about some of the wrestling that aired on TV that you actually watched. I guess AEW and WWE content you watched over the last week. Well, no, I didn't watch any WWE content. I watched Paul Heyman content because what did you say to me the other day on the phone? What is the end game of this? An Oscar nomination? Paul Heyman? Because what? I mean, it's just, it's insane. The, the, uh, the care that he took to put, this thing together of course we're talking about it was on smackdown christmas eve the first thing you see after a recap of the previous week where roman reigns fired paul and gave him the superman punch and we come to find out that you know paul has been protecting roman reigns he says from brock lesnar so he does a sit down with kayla braxton and he's sitting there and he hasn't shaved in a couple of days and he hasn't dyed his hair so he's got the gray roots and he just looks disheveled and his lip was quivering and he was low-key and he was you know telling the 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 story of how he told the truth to roman reigns but it was truth he didn't want to hear and so as a result paul said i got embarrassed and humiliated publicly for telling the truth and well he should have known all these years he's never done it right? The one time he tells the truth in public, he's embarrassed and humiliated. <laughs> but that was the, the, it was a tremendous sit down interview where basically it was an oratory from Paul where he again still calls into question what his motivations were and whose side he's really on. He said that Roman Reigns was the greatest champion of all time, but needed to be protected from Brock. And that he's he's sipping water. He's introspective. Is his career over? One of the fucking goof mark sites actually put up a headline: Paul Heyman released from WWE. Did you? Because somebody I did not Twitter, see that. No, somebody on Twitter said, "Look at this." Well, that's ridiculous. Um, but anyway, he was so. I mean, a. a you would want to believe these things that he's saying because there was so much feeling and depth and emotion in it. And then I wrote, I can't believe that they're doing Brock and Reigns on New Year's Day on a first-time pay-per-view and not Royal Rumble or WrestleMania, but 
then again, there's going to be some life in this. This is not the last time these two are going to fucking wrestle. I'm scared, as I say, that it might turn into a a three-way or some kind of goofiness. But this is brilliant because the the people, the only way you can make Brock and Roman brand new is is the 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 discussion and the the controversy and the question over what's Heyman going to do, whose side is he on, and how is he going to come out of this? And it's fucking great because he's carrying the whole thing. Reigns and Brock, neither one was on this show. You didn't see, I asked you about it, they did a video package later on in the program on Heyman, and they went all the way back to WCW and ECW footage when he was young and had hair and fairly slim, not attractive, but slim. And then, and they showed footage of the botched invasion angle and inv- <laughs> basically not saying that they botched it, saying Paul's invasion failed. Uh, but then, you know, the story of him being with Brock and then finally, uh, when Brock is done, the, the voiceover was, Heyman was rescued from obscurity by Roman Reigns and has been the tribal council. So they painted the picture, which is, you know, adds to the thing that Paul Lee has always been in the mix as a mad scientist and what kind of deal can he put together and who can he latch on to? And and finally, he's had this run with Reigns, but now what's going to happen? And is Paul's career over? And so it, it was a great package, again, for the angle and the whole controversy is around what the manager is going to do and how he's going to play into it. So they don't have to do incessant physical angles between these two where one beats one up one week and the other one beats the other up the other week. And by the time they have the match, you don't give a shit because you've already seen them beat each other up. I love it. Go ahead. I was just going to say, because for years, you know, way back in the early nineties, there was always a little bit of, competition between you and Heyman and it was always kind of a runaway thing you were the better manager and Paulie Dangerously was really good but after a while there was a shelf life and it didn't make sense anymore that character the psycho yuppie as soon as Paul started lying in front of the camera (laughs) the way he lied to people who worked for him or he was trying to get a deal with or whoever it was whenever he took that real Paul Heyman and applied that in a suit to his on-air character, he crossed the line from just being another really good manager to being, like, all-time level. Yeah. He's right now doing the best work of his career by far, but extraordinary stuff for anyone. Yeah, and and that's the thing. is it In the same vein as, you know, I couldn't be the mama's boy. I mean, look at Paul's... We've, we've said this before. He's either three or four years younger than me, or four or five, whatever it is, but... He couldn't be the psycho yuppie forever. And I couldn't really be the mama's boy forever. And both of us, well, actually, I took a break that didn't really end, but he took a long break from managing or doing anything in, in performing wise in wrestling. And by the time he came back, he was older, but also he was wiser and smarter, even. And you know, it's it's more him. Like, if I was doing something now, it would be more me. And this is, you know, like, I'm well, I'm doing this show now, and this is more me. I still seem to stir people up, but I'm not out here just doing it. My mama said, you know, whatever. And like you said with Paul, <laughs> this is way more him than the psycho yuppie was. He may have been psycho, but not in that way. Um, But Paul is a master manipulator and a verbal con artist that twists and lies and spins and prevaricates and whatever he does to get people to do what he wants them to do. And that's who he is on TV. And that's perfect. So he's, it's, it's natural and believable now. And, you know, and I've always said about Paul, he, when Paul was the psycho yuppie, he was always trying to be vicious, right? He always had the bass in his voice. He, ah, I've got a kid. He would pop a vein. I'm to kill you. And I always say, back up a little bit and do something a little different every once in a while. Every once in a while, I was 
joking and laughing or every once in a while I was scared and crying or whatever. Now with Paul, he shows the entire range of emotions and phrases it in the manner in which that Paul would phrase things if he was trying to con you, I mean, speak to you in a personal conversation. So, but I get, you know, as we, as we all get older and we figure out more shit, we, anybody who continues performing has more of themselves in everything. And now he's, there is no, it's the perfect wrestling combination. There's really not much difference between Paul on TV and Paul in person. You know why this is also great? WWE TV sucks. Yes. <laughs> but with this, what's going to happen? Who's he turning on? I literally have no idea how they're going to play this out, and I want to see it. Yeah. And also, it's worth DVRing this crummy show to zip through it and see if you get five to eight minutes of Paul Heyman. So that was that on uh, SmackDown for the WWE. But like I said, we are going to check out... Uh, Panic in the Year Zero, or whatever they're, what is it, Day One, uh, on January the 1st, and we'll talk about it next week on the program. Well? Well? Sound like Hawk now. Well! We snack on danger and dine on death. Ooh. Well, this week we snacked on dynamite and dined on rampage. What do you want to talk about first? I guess we'll talk about Dynamite first. Well, it Dynamite came first. Came first. Uh, Rampage, there was not a lot of ramming or paging on Rampage this week, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I thought he left a lump of coal in my stocking last week. But boy, oh boy. The AEW the Wednesday before Christmas was in Greensboro, North Carolina, a historic wrestling location. And the people there, you know, they still, they have the long memories in the Carolinas and they know the, the history of their wrestling there. And even David Crockett, who was there, got a nice round of applause. He was on the Rampage show, but it was in the same place. And where else is David Crockett going to get a round of applause these days in a wrestling arena? People probably weren't born last time David was on the air, but in the Carolinas, they remember the name Crockett. Boy, did he shrink. Um... No, he did. He just got gray. Was he always that short? May <laughs> what the? F no, he had his shins removed in a in a shin related fucking frog gigging accident. Yes, he was always the exact older same people height he lose is now. some of their height. Vince McMahon doesn't look like he's as tall as he used to be. Older people lose some of their height. Not when you didn't have that much to begin with, and it's not like that. You know, he's. 85 now and he was standing up straight he was about that tall anyway nevertheless let's start right out with it adam cole for christmas i got my hopes dashed not only of adam cole ever doing anything worthwhile in the wrestling business again but now if the undisputed era is reunited i don't give a shit the first 20 to 25 minutes of this program was every bad habit that AEW has ever had that they haven't learned how to fucking not do. From the start, when they actually met, this is national television, they're coming on the air at 8 o'clock, and the match is Adam Cole versus our little dog Pockets. The company mascot opens the show against a... A guy who was a WWE superstar until just about three or four weeks ago and has now been relegated to bad comedy skits. So I, I, as soon as I saw the match, I said, okay, they've completely nullified any meaningful impact that Adam Cole could have had on their business. He was a secondary, it put in a secondary position when he debuted underneath Danielson and he's been associating with clowns and jackoffs and immersed himself in bad comedy ever since and I was hoping that the undisputed era reforming or much of it might have an impact we will find out that it won't so I fast forwarded this because I'm not going to watch this match it's a fucking joke right it's an insult to 
what I thought Adam Cole had for a career. It went 20 minutes. 20 minutes with this fucking guy. One good sign said Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish are better than the Hardly Boys. But then Bobby Fish comes out to distract the mascot. Like Adam Cole should need distraction to beat the company mascot. And then Kyle O'Reilly comes in the ring from behind. The people seem like, oh shit. He hits three strikes. <laughs> bing, bing, bing. On our little dog Pockets before Pockets falls to the ground and then jumps out and Adam Cole rolls in and still hits his finish on his fucking wafer thin, fishy white fucking joke. Which one are you talking about is wafer thin? Well, now fishy it's both white? of them, unfortunately. Yeah, give me a break. Um, so then... O'Reilly gets on pockets on top of him to start beating the shit out of him. And guess what they did? Fake punches that looked like shit because pockets was all covered up and there was no place to hit him. And O'Reilly is doing the same thing now that all the other outlaw guys do where they just throw punches in the vicinity of the head and they have no steam behind them and they don't land and they look like shit. So instead of bringing the company up they have debuted three quarters of the top group from nxt that for the last three years bobby fish hadn't won a match yet cole needs help to beat the company mascot and kyle o'reilly debuts against the pudding gang then Page and O'Reilly face off like they might be mad at each other because remember they actually broke up in NXT before they all left. But at this point, while they're facing off at each other, here comes Trent and Muffin Top Taylor and the people do not react. They run into the ring and then Cole and Fish and O'Reilly all turn around together and start beating up the pudding gang and the fans didn't care. As a matter of fact, the ones that were making noise were a slight undisputed chant while the heels are kicking the shit out of the supposed baby faces. They're chanting for the heels. Then Fish and O'Reilly hit a modified double goozle on Trent, turn him upside down. And got a pop for that. So they're turning babyface by beating these fucking schlubs up because it's Greensboro especially. And the fans in general have gotten tired of seeing these fucking mud show idiots on every national TV program. So then, Cole and Fish and O'Reilly stand there while the job guys that they beat up magically disappear. And the people are just bleh because they just beat up some job guys. And then out come the Hardly Boys. So now they're going to do another jealous ex-lover angle, this time between them and Cole. And the Hardly Boys come in and stand there staring at Adam Cole. Adam Cole staring at them. Fish and O'Reilly have their backs turned to the Hardly Boys and won't look at them, which looks very unnatural since people have just come into the ring that you probably ought to keep an eye on. And they're all standing there waiting for the people to start caring and making noise and cheering or booing or rumbling or something. And they didn't. All the fans are going, what the fuck have we, have we just seen here? And why are we seeing it? And then Cole and Fish and O'Reilly leave together and the Hardly Boys are standing there, and the announcers are selling it as an explosive situation, and the only noise in the arena is Adam Cole's music playing to cover up the crickets chirping. Your thoughts? Obviously, I have not been a fan of anything with Adam Cole and AEW so far. The Orange Cassidy feud maybe being the bottom of the barrel so far. Mm. So I wasn't really looking forward to this match, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't watch it too closely. I'm not going to disagree with any of your problems with Orange Cassidy. He's in better shape than Adam Cole. He's got a six-pack. He's got some <laughs> muscles. He's in better shape than Adam Cole. 
So that's why I jumped in before when you were talking about the shape, just because Adam Cole has all the ability, but this is what he's doing right now, and this guy's in better shape. Kyle O'Reilly, they had an opportunity for a big debut. I personally don't think they captured that opportunity well here. He didn't debut against any main event star on the roster. He didn't debut against anybody that would be in a key position on a pay-per-view. He didn't debut against anybody that would be in a key position to draw money in a main event match. He jumps in and helps, doesn't even do it by himself, helps Adam Cole beat the company mascot. And it seemed to me, and I've always said that sometimes, I don't know if there's issues between how it's coming across on TV and how it is in the room, but you just said the same thing. It seemed to me like the room was dead for all this. And it's happened before with Young Bucks book stuff, where I think it was, I forget what the angle was. It was something with Omega where there was just a lot of standing around waiting for, I don't know what. It was almost like they were trying to remember what to do next. And they didn't know when to start or how to do it? No, I think they were standing there thinking that the people would start rumbling and have this major thing where they all stood up and got into this confrontation between Adam's new group and his old group. And obviously the people wanted to see Adam with his old group, not against job guys. And I don't think they gave a shit about Adam's new group of job guys and comedy figures. And they didn't make any noise. And they're all standing there waiting for the fans to get into this shit. That brings up, are the Hardly Boys burying these guys on purpose now, doing bad shit with them? Or are they convinced that they're still over now that people are starting to see through them and they've got better talent in the company? See, I think part of the problem is even the diehard Young Bucks fans will rave about their matches and their work rate and everything they do and they're the greatest of all time and no one has ever flipped like they flip. Even that fan has to admit their angles and their promos are awful. They're not good at that end of the business at all. I'm not a fan of their wrestling either, but I can acknowledge they have big fans, big fan base for that, I should say. But their comedy, their promos, their angles, it's always the worst thing on the show. And it's weird. Whenever it's a Southern California influence on AEW, it's usually the worst segment in the show. If it's from Chicago or the East Coast or even the Southeast, <laughs> it's typically all right. But this was not good, and it was a waste of Kyle O'Reilly. And having the best friends in the mix here immediately drags it down. I know they don't see it this way because they're baby faces and they sell some merch, but it's like having the Hardy family office involved with something. It immediately drags it down to, oh, these guys are jobbers. This is a jerk-off thing. I don't care how popular Orange Cassidy is with some people. And then that's how you debut Kyle O'Reilly, and then I just don't think people care about the Bucks programs. They just want to see the flips in the matches. Well, I'd like to flip the page and continue on, because I'm going to sp speak flip the page. That was a pun, and I didn't even realize it, but next up, and by the way, the rematch, thankfully we're getting one. They would have been insane if they didn't. Uh, between Adam Page and Daniel Bri Brian Danielson, uh, will take place January 5th on the new network The T when they move over to TBS. Well, that's great. I'll watch another one of those matches in a heartbeat. It gets interesting to see what kind of finish they're going to do. And I got this leads into the Adam Page interview that happened afterwards. I'm not knocking Adam Page, and I just said that he, last week or whatever it was, week four last, he had the best match that they've ever, the best title match that they've ever presented in AEW, and maybe the best wrestling match. Do you think that Adam Page's perception from the fans, not just the AEW faithful who will accept anything, but his general perception, is he a world champion? When he walks out for that live interview, when he appears, when he comes down to the ring for a match, is he perceived as a singles world champion by, or do they still have some work to do? I think to the most hardcore AEW fan, they accept it. They see him as that. For me, I don't get that world champion feel off Adam Page personally. And if I'm going to be very honest, despite a few really good ones, I actually think his promos hurt him because they don't sound genuine sometimes. 
sometimes they sound really pre-arranged, pre-rehearsed. And to me, that hurts him. And then you see Danielson is out there and he feels free. He feels like he's just walking off the cuff. And when you see them back and forth, one guy feels natural, the other guy doesn't. I mean, that's my perspective. Well, and part of that, I call that to your attention because the Danielson and Page promo here, I got to be, if if for the past two years, if Adam Page had been having matches, single matches, at the top of the card against quality opponents like Brian Danielson and doing interviews against him and doing these same things when he was a challenger and somebody else, Danielson perfect, be the champion, for the last two years, that then, yes, I think now, everyone, not just the AEW Kool-Aid drinkers, would perceive him as the world champion. But he has he was stalled in that tag team with Twinkle Toes forever, where you knew they were going to break up at some point, but it never fucking happened. Bunches of matches with the Hardly Boys. Uh, I won't even go into, again, the whole thing with the dork order and being a sad drunk and everything. But I'm just talking about, is this the way you push a guy? Maybe in the story that they concocted at the start and stuck with, despite the fact of how rotten it was playing out on television, maybe it made sense. But to the average wrestling fan... Shouldn't they have seen Page wrestling single matches near or at the top of the card against veteran opponents, winning more than he lost, sometimes suffering setbacks and an occasional controversial loss, coming back to rehabilitate that record and get his win back, and show this as a single before he won the world title? because what they did was they they had this guy for two years they made him a tag team guy and had him do a bunch of flippy stupid matches whether you like that or not involved him with job guys as friends and opponents made him an unreliable sad drunk in this storyline that all 700,000 AEW fans just think was so classic of long term storytelling made him look like complete fucking moron then he wins the belt after he takes two months off. Then well, he no, wins no. the belt. Well, let me stop you. He wins the belt after he apologized to the Young Bucks for being a drunk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they came to ringside and didn't interfere because, well, he had redeemed himself. Yes, he, since he apologized, we're going to let him have the belt. And then he's the world champ. And then he has the first match of his career that was really a world championship level match. As the champion, not the challenger. That usually doesn't happen. So I think they've done this backwards. But anyway, Page's promo, he was disappointed about the the hour draw. And he made his point. And then Danielson interrupts with no music, by the way. And after Page had already made his point and had been talking for a while instead of the way they usually do it. So that worked. And Danielson comes out and, as you said, like it's off the top of his head and natural because he's experienced and he's a veteran. And if the young cowboy had challenged a champion like this, he could have been made. And he, Danielson tells him he's an entitled millennial cowboy that still has the title and he's disappointed. Well, I kicked your ass for 60 minutes. I should be the one to be disappointed. And he said he's not wrestling till January 5th. So he's not taking any chances on getting hurt. But, and this is where, help me with this. Danielson says, if Paige stalls again and runs out the clock and goes the hour, then he wants to make sure that the rightful winner and the rightful champion still has the belt, so he's got the solution. Judges! Judges at ringside! I'm not sure if Patty Mullen and Jason Hervey are available. I know Sandy Scott is not going to be able to be there. However, Ken Osmond also. And I, well, no, Ken Osmond was not a judge. Oh, that's right. He was just there hanging out. He was just there to do that promo with me because he always wanted to meet Jim Cornette. But anyway, and also TBS was airing the new Leave It to Beaver at that time. So, but here's the thing. Did you notice this? And I, I 
I saw it a mile away. As soon as he said it, I said, you fucking gave something up here. All Brian Danielson said was, well, there's going to be judges at ringside. So either this is a red herring or it's a slip, one or the other, but it made Paige look goofy anyway, because unless he wasn't supposed to say it like this, Paige does a decent job of firing back at him and is kind of in control verbally at the end of the thing. But he said, if you want judges, then sure, let's get some old guys, some paydays. And he said, I've fought too hard to be the champion, to have some old prick at ringside tell me I'm not good enough. Nobody mentioned any judge's name or their age. So does this mean that Paige is, is uh, trying to lay this red herring for us by the conjuring up the image? Well, it's going to be a bunch of old retired wrestlers. And it turns out that Danielson brings in some young people and that it will be favorable to him. And that's the way the title changes. Cause I hope it does because goddamn Brian Danielson needs to be the champion of this company. Or are the, is, did he just slip and they're really going to have a bunch of fucking old timers there. And Paige just became a mind reader because nobody mentioned their names or their ages or any identity to them. What do you think? Yeah. I don't know if he gave that away, but he gave away that it'll be older wrestlers and but will it? I mean, who else would it be? More than likely, it would be older wrestlers. Well, it's the heels idea. Tony loves bringing in older wrestlers and giving them a payday. That is true. But it's the heels idea. So did Paige just say, okay, fine? Because he did say, okay, fine, because we ain't going to go an hour. I'm going to beat you before that. So I'm telling you. And, and once again, this this is Brian Danielson, and he's smarter than all the rest of these people, obviously. Because all the rest of these people are doing fucking Mark booking in the basement, and he's Brian's shit's interesting. They, the fans complained that they went to an hour draw in a world title match like that. Well, oh my God, how dare they do something like that? It was the best match. It was the best thing they've ever done. So now tell me that these people's heads won't spontaneously immolate. If Brian Danielson was to bring in ringer judges and they, they go another hour and they give the belt to Danielson on a fucking judge and Paige is bullshit and Tony Khan's bullshit and now Danielson's the champion, but at the same time, he never beat Adam Page. But Adam Page has never beaten him. And then Tony could get on his knees and beg Cody, please give up the stipulation. <laughs> please take the title back. That wasn't where I was going with that. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Uh, but anyway, that would be some wrestling. Imagine that. That would be some high-level booking that may be, you know, past everybody here, but not Danielson. So uh, we'll see what happens. Right now, Danielson has that thing where if he's on TV, I stop what I'm doing and I watch. Sometimes yeah. I have wrestling on and I'll be doing something on my computer. Sometimes I'm just lifting weights. Whatever it may be, I'm doing something. With Danielson, he's one of those guys, I got to see what he's going to say. I got to see what he's going to If it's one of his matches, I got to watch it. Just because they're really beautiful when you watch what he's doing. But he's just so captivating right now. It's, it's like watching Van Gogh paint. So you put the belt on him right now. Yeah, because think about this. Paige does not have to lose. And then Danielson's got the belt totally unfairly, and all the AEW fans' heads are on fire. And then there's a rematch again on the next pay-per-view, conveniently in March or so, which gives Danielson time to build up some fucking heat. Then Paige gets some fucking sympathy going for his the way he's been fucked around. And then do you do the money back guarantee stipulation? Because Tony, everybody knows Tony Khan has billions. He could do it for pay-per-view. Paige comes out there and, and says, Tony Khan says that he's so mad at Brian Danielson that by God, he trusts me. If I don't beat Danielson for the belt this time, he's going to refund everybody's money that buys the pay-per-view. There And now, and then Paige gets a fucking big victory over this fucking heel champion that he should have had a long time ago. Just a thought. <sighs> I don't know. I mean, again, though, then you're putting the belt back on Paige. 
the, the well, question, now maybe he might have earned it. Well, that's the bigger question. Does Paige, you brought it up earlier, does Paige feel right now like a world champion to you? Do you think all of a sudden he's going to be repaired in the time between now and the next pay-per-view? They got fucking eight or ten weeks to bring out every top fucking star they've got that's not named Danielson or CM Punk and let Paige beat him right flat in the middle on TV. He's got to earn his chance to get it again. If If he can beat everybody that they put in front of him weekly for the next eight weeks, then Tony Khan will give him the return match at the title, his last chance to save the company and redeem himself. And Tony will even put that money back stipulation on him. If he can beat all these guys, he'll have that title match. And then every week he beats somebody else in a good match. One, two, three with no fall to all or interference. If you can't fucking sacrifice almost anybody on your roster to the guy that is currently your champion and is going to be your next champion, then why are they all there? Then you've, you've done, it wouldn't be as good as doing it from scratch two years ago, but at least you've goddamn given him meaningful victories. You've put a baby face in a position where he has adversity. He's got a stumbling block in front of him. He's been unfairly treated and he wants to get even, but he's got to move heaven and earth to do so. That's how you sell fucking tickets. Or Warlo Ward Warlord, Wardlow. <laughs> that may be a slip. War well, Warlord, Wardlow, War Wardlow the Warlord. Wardlow can come out and beat Arnold Finster with a couple of power bombs again. Which is what he did next. Were we done with Paige? I'm done with Paige. I think we're done with Paige, and with the Wardlow thing, I'll just say I'm done with Spears too. Yeah, well. <sighs> I mean, at least now they're they're acknowledging what what's going on, and it's on purpose. But I think before it was just by accident that he was stealing Wardlow's spotlight, <laughs> coming in beating the guy up with chairs. But now the announcers are actually mentioning it, and he doesn't like it, so they're getting with the program a little bit. And but, I guess now you have someone to feed him when he first turns babyface before he does whatever he does to get to MJF, which you have to think eventually would be what they did. Yes, but not for a long time because MJF has bigger fish to fry. And speaking of somebody that should be fried, fried, died, and laid to the side, as Butch Reed used to say, <sighs> I hate to say this because I liked him when he started, but Dan Lambert has run out of gas. Bad. Bad. Again in the balcony is Dan Lambert with Scorpio Sky and the other page. And suddenly they begin talking to interrupt an announcer on camera. So somebody with the production has given them a microphone and the spotlight shines on them. So the whole idea of them being in the balcony, there's some kind of outsiders interrupting the show. No, it's like fucking who are the Muppets in the, in the balcony? Statler and Waldorf. Statler and Waldorf. Then they get the spotlight and they get their part of the show. It's obviously sanctioned by AEW or elsewise this would not be happening this way. But what wasn't sanctioned by AEW was as soon as Lambert starts talking and there's Sky and, and the other page mugging some guy with a beer and his girlfriend with an ice cream sundae wandered into the fucking shot. Did you see that? I did see that, yes. And they come through the curtain that's right behind them and they see that they're, they're in the spotlight. And the guy's got his beer and the girl's got her, her sundae and they're like, oh shit, we're on TV. And then one of the security guys you can see kind of go, hey, get the fuck out of here. Here's the thing. Well, I said he's... <laughs> Lambert was good for the first few weeks because he was off the top of his head saying shit like we say that like he would say because he's been a longtime wrestling fan it just shit's silly and boring and stupid and fake and all these kids are playing right it wasn't new material but it was obviously mostly what he felt and he had some emotion when he said it and then they carried it on and even though that jericho finished it off when they just beat Dan up, left him laying there, whatever. They still carried it on to that fucking goofy match. And then they beat Lambert again. Now he's still around. But now, not only after all that, they've taken all the heat off of him before he ever really had it established. But he himself did that interview with one of the websites where he said, well, a lot of the stuff I say on TV, I really believe. 
a lot of it. And admitting that he was being employed by AEW, so that finished it off. And now, Dan, you're reciting your memorized script. I'm trying to tell you this as a, as a fan and friend. It sounds as phony as a football bat. You're reciting verbiage. You have less feeling in it now than the day that you started when you should have been an inexperienced you're fledgling. It's not good anymore. He got heat at the start because he told the truth that a lot of those fans didn't want to hear and sounded like he meant it. But after several weeks and getting beat up and revealing he's playing a character, and now it sounds like he's reciting a script, it's not good anymore, and now they're trying to put him in the position which they actually had him say of trying to be the one to get Cody cheered, which apparently nobody, including Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun, can accomplish these days. Did I give an accurate depiction of the Dan Lambert segment here? I think so. I mean, I thought it sucked, but I thought almost every segment he's been in has been awful. The plot holes, like why is he in the box? Why is the spotlight on him? Why does he have a microphone? Why are they allowing him to broadcast this on TV and to the house? That's always been questionable why any of this is happening. He's with Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page. I know why you don't like Ethan Page. I actually think Ethan Page has a look, and he's got talent. Scorpio Sky is just, he's just bland. I'm sorry, and I know he's trying to ham it up up there. And AEW, you know, I was thinking about it the other day, because there's so many guys that we think, why are these people still there? And there have been some guys that thankfully got off TV relatively quickly. We haven't seen the Good Brothers in a while. Hadn't thought about that until the other day, and I was like, oh, thank God. We haven't seen those guys in a while because they were awful. Well, I think their deal fizzled out with impact. Well, I hope the deal between Tony and Dan Lambert fizzles out because this is not only bad, but no one gives a shit at all. He was yelling at that crowd, and I think people just want this part of the show to end. Yes, he he has he has frustration. He has he doesn't have heat, he has frustration. Yes. Right. People are frustrated. It's like, can we just be done? But but now go back and look at the first couple of weeks and people were throwing shit at him and people were screaming so loud, shut the fuck up, that he you couldn't hear what he was saying because it was new and they kind of bought it at the start and they could have done something with it. And instead of putting him with again Sky and the other page, he's got access to some of the biggest names in mixed martial arts. And that would be entirely worth bringing them into the fold, but not in the way that they did it, where it just they would do in the parade thing where, okay, I've got these two flunky wrestlers that you used in the middle card, but because I say they've studied mixed martial arts, I'm going to put them in with my group of former UFC champions. And then we're going to debut them in multiple man matches, not even on pay-per-view, and and get very little, if any, fucking revenue out of this. You can't mean to tell me with a guy that could fucking, at, at least at first, convince the people that he knew that their wrestling was horse shit and then can bring in a former UFC champion that somebody could have fucking trained with for a while and got through a single match so you could sell it on fucking pay-per-view. But but no, they make him fake. They make these guys fake. The fake, 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 fakety, fakety, fake, fake. That was that segment. And why, again, Tony Schiavone in a Santa hat on a Christmas set with Britt Baker and Reba and Jamie dressed as her elves. And I know that Britt Baker is a bigger star than her boyfriend is now. But... Why is, again, is the announcer in love with, if friends with, palling around with, taking up for the fucking heel? You've got beloved Tony Schiavone, who's right there with this girl is trying to get heat, and he's endorsing her as a wonderful person. So that psychology is so fucking around the bend, I can't figure it out. And the, But the only bad thing about this promo on Britt's part is she was talking about having another match 
with Riho, which is apparently going to take place on one of these shows coming up, either the new TBS show or a Rampage or whatever, but we can't get away from that. I'm afraid that they're going to put the belt back on Riho because Britt's way too old, way too tall, and way too good a worker for fucking Twinkle Toes. Are you excited about seeing Britt tackle Riho again? No, I'm not particularly excited about that match. And I think Omega's actually been a supporter of Britt Baker's from what I understand. But let me just say, I think Britt Baker's so good on camera. She's so good talking, which is amazing if we remember those first heel promos that she did, which were a nightmare. Yes. And she's so good right now. I like Hater as kind of the muscle. I hope, I hope they don't turn her right away, although it seems like they uh, may be. Reba just, you know, drinking, hanging out as the flunky. Shivani bothers me in these things. What is he doing? And he's not, I don't know. You know how I feel. There's a revisionist history that Shivani was this great announcer in the 90s. In reality, he was awful in WCW. And he's not bringing much to the table now. It's just, you know, he's someone they like. So they keep him around and they hire him. But I don't think Shivani's good in any of these things. And he just, what was he doing here? He's doing shtick. I don't want that. I, I don't, uh, and, and it's not even a, a question of the quality of his announcing. It's if he's representing the announcing team, the crew, the promotion, then why is he friendly and validating the lies that the heel tells when she... Uh, it, it's it also the quality of his announcing. It's also the quality of his announcing. He doesn't say anything. He just throws out a phrase and then goes silent. No, but I'm just saying whether the announcer is great or the shits, they shouldn't be validating the heel's opinion right right yes and coming up next was a package on the owen hart tournament which i thought was very well done some of the guys with what owen meant to them um some were more articulate than others on that but they not only you see everybody was like well fuck wwe owns all the owen hart footage they were able to use japan they were able, able to use some Calgary, some stuff, home footage from Martha, because obviously she's involved. So it was a nice package and a nice chance to see Owen Hart on TV again after what's 20 something years. The only thing I didn't like, and I know it's kind of a minor thing, but it's just one of those things in wrestling and WWE's done it a lot that I really don't like. I don't like having the heels all of a sudden show you that they have a heart. You know, if Adam Cole's a heel, he shouldn't be in this talking about how much he loved Owen and how much that... I'm not saying it's not true, and right. he shouldn't say that to Martha, but if he's a bad guy, why do you show him in such a sympathetic light on the same show where he's a bad guy? That's I don't oh, like that. Again, because they're going to go, oh, because this is real life. It's all supposed to be real life, you fucking idiots. Um, yes, that is. But that goes back to... You know, shit stained 20 years ago. Well, this is a shoot. Well, how how are we supposed to know the difference? Why don't you give us a fucking guidebook so we know when we're shooting and when we're working? Because I just always go with it. Everything's a shoot. Uh, but anyway, nice pa nice package. That's what she said. But I'll tell you one thing, Brian. You'll get plenty of nice packages if you patronize our friends at Home Medics. That's right, home edics. That's exactly right, because, well, folks, whether you have been working your fingers to the bone, and you know what you get when that happens, bony fingers, and you've been putting up Christmas decorations, you've been going out and shopping, you've been carrying the family up and down the stairs, whatever you've been doing, you're, you're sore, you got body pain, well, the home medics line of equipment can take care of that in a heartbeat. If you're older, everything's sore, you don't recover like you used to, you need to get massaged. You need to be rubbed the right way. You need to have heat and cooling and massaging and cushioning and things. And the folks at Home Medics have all of those things. It's a family-owned and operated and established business. And their whole line of massage products is meant to make you feel better from a massage gun with built-in hot and cold technology. And I understand that, that it's a forty five caliber gun, but that the bullets actually no. shoot. Huh? There are no bullets. Well, they shoot, they shoot hot and cold technology into you. 
Via osmosis, yes, but there were no actual bullets. Nothing to worry osmosis, about. Osmosis? I thought that was only to do with plants, but it's a massage gun with built-in hot and cold technology. There's a massage cushion that lets you lie down or sit up depending on your therapeutic needs. You set it in your chair. You can lay down on it on the floor or on your bed, and it massages your back and your neck. And boy, howdy, don't try to suck on that massager because it'll knock your teeth out. Uh, there's a, Well, just if, if I turned over and was laying face down, and boy, that was a mistake. <laughs> but anyway, they've got a three-in-one foot massager. And this thing, is it's like a big oval thing, and you stick your feet in the holes, and it it massages your feet and heats them up. And the vibration's so powerful, it says it will loosen the muscles in your legs and lower back. It also sometimes will loosen your fillings if you turn it up all the way. That's just if you've got the Louisville Gas and Electric Service. I think they give us a little bit more power. It is safe for your fillings unless Dr. Mike Leno was your dentist. Well, there's where my problem was. Leno's the one who put my fillings in. No wonder they fell out. But anyway... The moral of the story is Home Medics has massagers that address your pain points from head to toe. And we've tried them, and they're amazing. And as I said, the Detroit family that founded this company in 1987 did it to help make people's lives better. And today they are the established leader in wellness and home health innovations backed by traditional wisdom and modern technology, plus an A plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. And they didn't cheat much on that application, folks. They're a brand you can rely on. Join the millions of customers who trust the Home Medics family to take care of their family. So, whether you're dealing with chronic pain, or just like me, a chronic pain in the ass, or you're just looking to help your muscles recover from a workout, right now if you go to homemedics.com slash Jim Cornette, that's H-O-M-E-D-I-C-S dot com, slash Jim Cornette, use the promo code Jim Cornette, you're going to get a free portable phone sanitizer when you buy $100 or more in massage products, which alone is a $60 value. And that we've talked about the, the germs and the pestilence and the amoeba that are on most of these phones, so they need to be sanitized. So this is a very healthy thing to do also. So massage yourself. Heat yourself up, cool yourself down, and clean your phone. Homedics.com slash Jim Cornette and use the promo code Jim Cornette at checkout for your free portable phone sanitizer with a $100 massager purchase. It'll be worth it. Clean your shit up. That's right. I'm not sure how much it was worth it to watch AEW Dynamite this week, but usually it's worth it. Uh, well... Next was the controversial segment in AEW, the match between Nyla Rose and Ruby Soho. And nothing about the match itself was controversial, but as you know, Brian, I do not watch AEW when it airs live because that way I can't skip through the commercials and the matches with Pockets and Hardly Boys. And Riho, but... I did get up the next morning and I turned on the Twitter machine and the Google machine and all of the news and everything. And I saw one of the first things I saw people talking about on Twitter was this headline. And I will, I won't even mention the place that I got it from in case they don't want to be involved, but here was the headline. AEW ejects transphobic fan who harassed Nyla Rose on dynamite. And then down it, there's a picture of Nyla Rose. And down at the bottom, it says AEW was forced to throw out a member of their crowd at AE Dynamite after the so called fan hurled transphobic abuse at Nyla Rose. And I'm thinking, holy shit, they've had another incident on live television. And I'm picturing from this description some one of these members, of these hate groups leaning over the rail, foaming at the mouth screaming slurs at Nyla Rose and security trying to pull him back. I'm thinking there was a scene here, right? And then I clicked on the story, which I'm doing again just to make sure that I get it right. And it, it goes down while Nyla Rose was making her entrance on Wednesday's show. A sign could be seen 
directed at Rose, which misgendered her. The native beast proved unflappable as she greeted the person holding the sign with her social finger, that means she flipped him off, before entering the ring. You want to know the rest of it, Brian? Yeah, let's hear the rest of it. That's it. That's the rest of it. The sign. And you know what the sign said? Do you remember the old t-shirts from years ago that would say I'm with stupid and had an arrow to the left or to the right. So basically the joke was, ha ha, whoever you're standing on that side of it, you're, you're calling them stupid, right? Well, this sign says Nyla Rose is this guy's dad with an arrow pointing to the left of this guy that's holding the sign. And apparently, I don't know if his friend was next to him or if he was pointing to anybody in particular or whatever the fuck. But he's just standing there holding it. There's no hurling slurs. There's no attempted physical action. There's no, everybody's standing there and he's, he's a smart ass fan, probably drunk, holding up a sign and that he thinks is humorous. And <clears throat> now it wasn't humorous because it didn't really play off anything. If the guy standing next to him that the arrow was pointing to had looked exactly like Nyla Rose, there may have been a of sight gag there, but since you couldn't see who it was pointing at, that wasn't available. If there was, if they were doing some kind of angle on the TV show with Maury Povich where he was going to reveal the father of somebody and it had a double meaning with their their angle or their television program, well, it might have been witty, but they don't. And so it's just a drunk, smart-ass fan with a sign in the crowd. And when I went and watched the television show, do you know what Nyla Rose did? Well, you do because you watch I the show. I watch the show, so I'll I do. tell everybody yeah. else. <laughs> she walked over there, saw the sign, flipped the guy the finger, turned her back on him, and went about and had her match. But suddenly, uh, besides the fact that that apparently they didn't kick the guy out right away, but they took the sign, and then I saw the guy sitting there, and then after a while I didn't, so I guess they went back and got him. But this on so many levels, people on Twitter were already losing their minds, and then when I mentioned on my Twitter the following, I'll, I'll read the exact tweet. I excerpted this article with that headline that conjured up images of chaos. And I said, boy, times have changed. When wrestling drew big crowds, fans got tossed out if they committed physical assault or pulled out a knife. If you'd toss them for saying, because I didn't have enough characters, if you'd toss them for saying horrible things and hurting the wrestlers' feelings, the buildings would have been empty like they are now. Now, besides for the little smart ass conclusion there about the current state of the empty buildings, Brian, that's kind of a factual observation of the difference between then and now without taking sides for anybody. Is it not? Did I advocate for anything there? You didn't advocate for anything. I observed that this is wrestling and you're going to have smart ass fans ever more now trying to be part of the show and they're going to bring signs in. I can't imagine why this caught any more attention than somebody on a production team going over to the fucking guy and saying, hey, the truck don't like your sign. It says either it goes or you and it goes. Pick, because I ain't got a lot of time. Take the guy's sign, and that's the end of it. <clears throat> they wa actually wanted to kick out a ticket-purchasing patron for having an insulting sign about one of the heels that apparently the heel just flipped the guy off and turned their back on him. In several respects, number one, 
I'm sorry, but I <laughs> fight the real fucking enemy. If you people, because when I tweeted that, and I love the hatred, because I don't know any of these people. I've never heard of them before. They're all the people on Twitter that only congregate amongst themselves until somebody says something that makes them mad, and then they come out, and I drink their tears, and I don't care, right? But they went ballistic. They lost their fucking minds. You horrible bigot. He was a bigot. That fan was a hateful bigot. They were likening the fan to Adolf Hitler calling for genocide. And because I didn't immediately say this is the worst thing that's ever happened to this poor individual and this is the worst person in the world and he ought to be strung up in the town square, I am a hateful, racist, bigoted, hate monger that doesn't deserve to live. As a matter of fact, one of the people on Twitter actually said that. You're a horrible human being, and I hope you and your whole family die of a lo of long malingering disease. Well, that sure tells me that you're a great person who cares about humanity. <laughs> anyway, so everybody lost their mind, and this is why, ladies and gentlemen, that the Republicans think that Democrats are all nuts because you lose your mind over a guy with a, a smart ass drunk with a sign at a wrestling show. I assume that all of those people whose heads caught on fire over the idea that somebody should bring a smart ass sign to a wrestling show and talk about Nyla Rose, obviously, you're out there every day campaigning for and bringing awareness to the hate groups that legitimately actually want trans people and gay people to be eradicated from the face of the earth. I assume that you are constantly voting against the Republicans that don't want any trans rights and don't want any gay rights, didn't want gay marriage. I assume that you're marching in the streets and engaging in an online campaign to call out and bring attention to the religious hate groups that think that fucking gay people and trans people and anybody that doesn't believe in God and is the same as they are should be eradicated because they're heathens and fire-breathing Satan worshipers. I assume you want to get rid of all those people and you're actively doing something about it since it so incenses you that somebody would bring a sign to a wrestling match. You know all those church groups that they march in the streets with signs, God hates F-words. And we all know that people who care about what God thinks about other people are the most not only gullible, but the easiest to influence of anybody. So they're the ones that go out and not only bomb the abortion clinics, but engage in violence against trans people and gay people because God's mad at them. That's what those groups are doing openly and under the pretense, not even paying taxes because they're under the pretense that they're religion and that they're a, a fucking positive group when in actuality they spread hate just like the Republicans that don't want anybody to have any rights, just like all the anti-gay. You know, what about the television evangelists that take old people's money for nothing, cruelly and heartlessly? They, they start these universities, colleges, where allegedly people are being taught and they learn, but what they're teaching them and what they're learning is the same kind of bullshit. Because they make these, this is, this is something that stands up because they're private colleges, private schools. You have to sign agreements, documents to go to school at these places that say that you will not engage in any type of perversion, which is what they call homosexuality. So if you're a guy and you diddle a dick, or if you're a girl and you mash a minge, it doesn't matter about your grades. They kick you out of the school and they can get away with it legally because of who you choose to have sex with. 
are you marching in the streets about these people? They already are teaching our youngsters that man coexisted with dinosaurs when God created the earth 7,000 years ago and all other kinds of fallacy and bullshit and science fiction. And they're also teaching people that gay people and transphobic people and people who don't want to fuck around with whoever you want to fuck around with are evil, should not have rights, and are going to hell if there was such a place, which there's not, by the way. So are all the people on Twitter who, whose heads exploded because a heel was the victim of a nasty sign. What are you doing about the real shit that's going on about the problem that you claim to fucking be concerned about is what I'd like to know. Where's your vote going? Where's your money going? Where's your mouth going? Where's your Twitter followers going? When people are really fucking with people in the world instead of a drunk smart ass at a wrestling show. And as far as being a heel, you, if you're going to get in any kind of entertainment or show business, whether it's wrestling or rock and roll or movies or whatever, don't have sensitive feelings. Because you're going to be called everything. You're going to be fucking subject to every form of abuse imaginable. And you need to be like me and learn to drink it in and appreciate it. I have had been pelted with cups of ice, soft drinks, rocks, shoes, balls, a horseshoe, a Vaseline jar in Cleveland one night. I have been cussed at, spit on, punched, kicked, hit and swung at with canes and umbrellas and purses, vomited on. I have been vomited on, as I've told the story on my way back to the ring in Little Rock, Arkansas, or from the ring in Little Rock, Arkansas one night. All the way down my leg from mid thigh to fucking ankle. I many guys have been cut and stabbed. Dennis Condry's been cut. Guys have had knives pulled on them. We've had people chase us down the interstate in vehicles. We have, of course, been called every name imaginable and not by one individual fucking goofball at ringside with a sign but by thousands of people at the same time that were actively also trying to get at us physically and the thing holding them back was police. So I have a hard time, and, and apparently Nyla Rose's feelings weren't that badly hurt. It was everybody else's on her account. But I have a hard time conflating a drunk, wise ass in ringside holding up a sign that didn't have any profane words or obscenities in it. By the way, here's another thing. Somebody said, well, Cornette, you used to come out before the Ring of Honor TV tapings and tell people not to cuss and say, well, of course I did. Because Ring of Honor was taping television for broadcast TV. And at that point in time, maybe over the last 10 years, I've missed the, the landmark decision that came down but at that point in time if you were on broadcast television and you aired words like fuck or any of the other famous seven words you can't say on television the federal communications commission the fcc would fine you they wouldn't find the person that said fuck they would find the broadcaster that broadcast it which meant that if we were having our fans cussing in in audibly chanting, cussing, fuck, whatever, we would either have to post-produce it, would cost time and money, or we would have to air it, and then every Sinclair broadcasting television station would have to pay the FCC a fine. So yeah, dumb shits. But there was no profanity on this sign. These people on their program say goddamn and shit and shithead and full of shit and prick and asshole and the fans chant you fucked up you fucked up but this smart ass sign somebody also said well no executive at turner network television wants to see a sign like that on their television 
Brian, do you know what's wrong with that? Besides the fact that I would assume most of the Turner Network television executives don't watch that show, if any of them did, they wouldn't have understood the sign because they don't live their lives on the internet and they don't know that Nyla Rose happens to be a member of the transgender community because they don't know the history and backstory of any of these fucking wrestlers. So they would it would have made no sense to them whatsoever and they would have said, well, look at all these weird signs these weird wrestling fans hold up. But if that sign said, fuck Nyla Rose, they'd be on the bat phone calling down there saying, what the fuck are you showing on our network? Because even though it's cable, you still can't do that. Somebody else said to me, said, well, this wasn't just a wrestling fan doing this thing and uh, about a heel. This was not directed at Nyla Rose's character. It was directed at her as a person. No shit, Sherlock, because the only people that believe there's a difference are the fucking modern wrestlers that are deluded into thinking that they're actors and entertainers. There is no difference, and there shouldn't be, between your character and you, which is why you need to learn to have a thick skin, especially if you're a heel, because they believe that you are that person, or they should if you're doing your job right. They do. And part of the problem with wrestling these days and reason why it doesn't draw what it used to is because most people don't believe that that's true and that they think that these are a bunch of people playing characters. And guess what? In a lot of cases, they're right, which is why a lot of these guys don't get over. And then somebody else said, well, I guess, Cornette, you're such a hate-filled, racist, transphobe. And I don't, where did race come into this at all? Race was not mentioned. I believe we're talking about sexuality. But they say you long for the days when the wrestling arenas were filled with signs with the N-word and you could just say all these things to all the fans. Number one, I have never in almost 50 years of going to wrestling matches seen a sign in an arena with the N-word. Never. As a matter of fact, in the 1970s and in the 1980s, really, till the late 80s, you didn't see any signs to begin with. Nobody brought signs to the arena. They chanted, if Jerry Jarrett was selling, they'd say, go, Jerry, go, because he's a baby face. Nobody brought signs because the fans then didn't come to be part of the show. They came to watch the show. Every once in a while, somebody's fan club president might have a sign for them at ringside and give them a cake on the way to the ring. So there were no N-word signs, because and there weren't any signs really in those days to begin with, but I've never seen one in modern times. In addition, none of the wrestlers, on a personal basis, yes, I'm sure many times, a wrestler has said to some individual every fucking thing that that individual was saying to that wrestler. But if you got on the microphone, you not only didn't say any racial slurs, but you didn't fucking cuss at all. Unless it was some fucking outlaw show in the middle of nowhere run by some fucking goof. Can you imagine what Christine Jarrett would have done if anybody would got on the microphone in the Louisville Gardens and said, hell or damn? The one time I remember cursing was when Lawler told the athletic commissioner to get, if you think it's over, get your ass in here and try to stop it. When he was trying to stop a pull apart between Lawler and Terry Funk with 20 people in the ring. And Christine was not real happy about fucking ass either. So that didn't happen. These people just think it did. And yes, I've heard the N word plenty of times back in those days. You know who I heard it from? I heard... Every fan in the building in Louisiana calling Hacksaw Butch Reed the N-word. And I saw those same thousands of fans moments later cheering at the top of their lungs every fucking breath the junkyard dog took. Or if you want to change territories, they cussed pork chop cash like a dirty dog and Rocky Johnson saved the day, and they carried him out of the building on their shoulders. 
if you say, well, there must be something wrong with that, it's because, yes, you're right. There is, because these it wasn't the wrestling arenas weren't filled with members of the Ku Klux Klan. They were filled with normal people that the heel was a no-good son of a bitch that lied and stole and cheated and fucking fucked around my favorite wrestlers, my heroes, and was a piece of shit with no redeeming qualities. And that motherfucker I call every name in the book. But a guy the same color? the same ethnicity, the same whatever. He's a baby face. He's standing up for us. He's the guy. We're carrying him out of the building like a conquering hero. It wasn't about color. It was about context and who was who. And the heels were the ones who were vented at because they were the antagonist to the protagonist. And somebody else said, well, what would Ernie Ladd have said? If someone had a sign with the N word on it, and I can actually give you a con uh, context into that, not a sign because we've mentioned there weren't any of those, but I came back one night, late 84, somewhere in one of the buildings. Cause Ernie came back for a little run at that point. And somebody on the way back from the ring had dumped a whole beer over me, past the cops, over the shoulder. I'm fucking soaking wet. My jacket, my tie, I stink like beer. I got it in my eyes. It's burning. Motherfucker, come back and throw my shit down. I'm like, I wish I could have fucking dinged that bastard with my racket. And Ernie's sitting there. He said, you need to look at this a different way, Jim Cornette. What are you talking about? All that abuse, that's the heels applause. Now, if they do something physical, then you got to protect yourself and do what you need to do. But the spitting and the cups and the beer and the garbage and the cat calls, that's the heels applause. That's your standing ovation. And then he said, and he didn't use the phrase N word, but I will. He said, every one of those fans out there that ever called me an N word put money in my pocket. Okay, I ain't argue with Ernie Ladd. We have become such fucking lunatics over the right way that everybody should speak to people and talk about people that we've forgotten to have any kind of perspective on who the real villains are and who the assholes are. And you're always going to have assholes. But a guy with a sign at ringside at a wrestling event, I could tell by the looks of this guy, he's not on the city council. He's not making any laws. He's not out there marching in the streets demanding that gay people be burned at the stake like some of these religious organizations. He's a fucking drunk putz at ringside with a sign making fun of one of the heels. And the heel did the right thing. Flip him off and turn your back. But everybody else going out of their fucking minds about this, I, I hesitate to think what would happen if something really bad or really challenging happened to poor Nyla Rose because it's just been said, well, she's incredibly strong that she could get through this. Get through what? Have somebody trying to run you off the fucking road or chasing you down with a fucking stick or trying to cut you or have a bunch of people out picketing saying that your people ought to be walked off the face of the planet Earth and dropped in a fucking hole somewhere. That might be something to go through. You might need some strength for that. Smart ass sign in ringside? Not sure about that. That's why the Republicans think we're all fucking lunatics. Because we have no perspective, and we don't fight the real enemy, <laughs> which makes it easy for them to fucking fuck us, right? So, and I don't know why that automatically everybody assumes that I'm transphobic, since, wait a minute, by the definition of phobic in the American Heritage, and by the way, that's the third edition of the American Heritage Dictionary, phobic... I'm getting to, I've got to pretentious, pointless, we're getting closer, pinch hit, phonology, 
Ah, here we go. Phoenix, Phoenician, Phoebe, phobia. A persistent, abnormal, or irrational fear of a specific thing or situation. I'm not phobic, because I don't give a shit. Because shouldn't that be the third option between I can't imagine hurting anyone's feelings, so I won't say anything, and all these people are evil and must die, should come right in the middle there somewhere. I don't give a shit. Because I've said this before. I don't give a shit if Nala Rose is transsexual. Because it ain't my business, and I don't, it doesn't have anything to do with me. But the point is, it's not my business or anybody else's business except Nyla Rose's business. So I'm not scared of anything Nyla Rose has done just because I wouldn't do it. Sort of like fucking eating pizza without toppings. I'm not scared of it, but I ain't going to do it. But there are people that are scared of this because it's weird or it's different or they can't explain it or God's pissed. And those are the ones you got to watch out for because instead of just saying, well, fuck it, better them than me and go on with your life, they want to do something about it. So for fuck's sake, I, 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 I nobody tried to commit violent mayhem on Nyla Rose and I'm sure she'll live to fight another day. And everybody who blew up about this whole thing on either side ought to get closer in the middle and say, I don't give a shit because it ain't my business. But if you do care about it because it is your business or somebody's business that you know or in your family, then why don't you go out there and do something about it instead of complaining on Twitter and fight the real enemy of the people that are actively passing laws and public policy to persecute you and or the people who are out there for no good reason otherwise than God said we shouldn't do that, trying to wipe you off the face of the planet. Leave the drunk wrestling fans alone. That's just my thought. What do you think, Brian? I agree with some of what you said. I disagree with some of what you said. We don't know if the fan was drunk, so I'm not going to assume that. You keep saying that. If he okay, had the, well, Those signs were not made by a drunk person. Those signs were made at home by someone who wanted to bring signs. So I'm not going to Okay, well, I'm just saying like that some, some goofy anyway. smart ass. He probably had a couple of beers, whatever. Here's where I'm at, and I kind of don't understand why you don't see it this way cuz it's to me it's very simple. We just did a half hour on this. To me it's very simple. <laughs> he brought a stupid sign. He was looking to get a reaction. Yeah. He got thrown out like he should have. Because there are certain signs anyone with any common sense sitting at home knows this is a sign that's cute. This is a sign that could cause a problem. Because it's completely fucking ignorant. Look, you can't compare now to 1984 or anything in the past. It's two different businesses. I hate to say it. Yeah. It's two different worlds, two different businesses. But that's also why I get upset when people say that things used to be a way that they were not. And I agree with you. And I agree. Okay. There is a, There are a lot of misconceptions about the way things were. People just think the wrestling business and the crowd were all just ignorant, racist, poor, yelling at each other, fighting, fucking. I mean, I get it. It's the perception <laughs> Hey, out there. that sounds like a fucking great time for me. No, I'll go ahead. But to me, this fan... When you bring that sign, he drew out that sign. He had a marker and he wrote the letters out. He drew the letters. You know what I mean? I like, think he did it by mental telepathy. There was thought that went into it. If he, he had he had premeditation. We can he show premeditation. That, yeah. I mean, that's the part that I don't get. You know, if you want to say people are losing their minds way too much over this, there's an argument there. If you want to say... Look, Nyla Rose did the right thing. She said, this guy's a fucking idiot. Fuck you. I'm moving on with my night. I'm going to go have a match on TV in front of a million people. Yeah. That's a good argument to have. Yeah. To me, there's no argument to, well, you know, we brought a sign. Just let him stay for the rest of the night. Oh, okay. I'm not even going to argue with you. Then fine. They could kick him out. That's too. the thing. 
He should have been thrown out right. By the way, you know, you want to talk 1984, should have been thrown into a room with Nyla Rose. And let's see him act all <laughs> tough then. Now, see, I'd back that up too. But you see, that, that's my whole thing. At least that's telling the guy, put your, put your fucking ass where your mouth is. If someone brings a because sign. Because that's the Nyla Rose could have kicked the shit out of this If guy. someone brings a sign like that, even if it's not using an actual uh, slur, even if it's not, you know, forcing aggression or pushing that, still there are signs, you know, if someone brings a sign when MJF's in the ring and says, the guy next to me likes Jews. You throw, like, <laughs> you throw that guy out of the fucking building. I'm sorry, well, you do. Well, no, wait a minute. That would be a positive thing, though, right? Don't we want all the people to like all the Jews? Do you think that's what the connotation of that sign is? <laughs> is a positive connotation? And I think that's the same thing you have to look at here. There was no positive connotation to the sign. This wasn't a sign, I'm going to hold this up and get the heel mad. There was none of that. This was either I'm going to make the people cringe and that was my reaction at home i cringed what a fucking idiot bringing a sign like that to a premeditated i was done in advance he brought that there waiting for his moment to get that sign out i'm sorry throw him far the fuck out of the building is my thing how far should should we should we put circles out there and if they get in the fucking 50 ring they get a special prize well okay and i again throw the guy out then that's fine but Again, the headlines and the reaction. Hurled transphobic abuse. Forced to throw out a member. Ejects transphobic fan. Harassed Nyla Rose. Is this how, where we've gone? That I mean, don't try to associate with the general American public. Because the we've proved already that most of them are fucking assholes. So if you're going to get twisted about this, this bad, when there's real bad shit going on and everybody's heads blowing up about like, this is the worst thing that ever happened to this poor old Nyla Rose. I hope it's the worst thing that ever happens to poor Nyla Rose. But you know, this day and age, I also think it's a good precedent for them to set because in this day and age where fans know more about the personal lives of wrestlers than ever before, you know, if a family member is, let's say, having a health issue and some fan brings a sign, you know, Oh, your dad's in the hospital. Your mom's in a wheelchair. Whatever it is. Yeah, you throw that guy the fuck yeah. out. Because that's what, yeah, the, to me, that's the thing. There's bringing a sign of being a putz and there's being an idiot coming up with a stupid idea and not realizing what would have been the only reaction from most reasonable people, which was to throw this guy out. And then d does this bring up also that maybe everybody ought to fucking take better care of the uh, public figures? celebrities ought to take better care of their personal information than fucking telling everybody everything and blurting out the, their entire lives on Twitter so everybody know what's going on with them. I completely agree with you. I think that that is a big issue with celebrities and athletes. I think it's an issue with the general public, quite it's frankly. It's an issue with the... I've, I've looked at every, a picture of everybody's dinner. You can Nobody can go to the doctor to get their blood pressure taken now without tweeting a picture of it. If I'm ever in a goddamn doctor's office in a bad way, you'll hear about it when I get better or don't. You will not see live updates. And listen, bring signs. If you got a problem with Nyla Rose's in-ring work, I do. Bring <laughs> signs. If you got a problem with Nyla Rose's manager, I do. Bring signs. But don't bring signs about what's between any wrestler's leg. Legs, I should say. Any wrestler's <laughs> legs. Or, or, or is Zach Gowan leg. still around? What was between his legs? But seriously, uh, like, that's the point. I mean, there's... You know when you're bringing signs. If you bring a sign that says Jericho sucks or I hate Jericho, you know what you're doing. If you bring a sign okay, that well, crosses again, a line. Again, then okay, then they could have gone over there and said, hey, you got to go. There was this huge fucking outcry. This guy's the worst human being that ever walked. He's obviously a card-carrying Nazi. Well, you know what that is, though. Everybody That's else is blown. It's everybody's fake fucking, you know, Twitter. What do they call it? Well, the part of it is justice the warriors Twitter mob. Whatever. Yeah, part of it is a small group of people on Twitter being very vocal, but the other part of it is, what do we know about wrestling news sites? They are desperate for clicks. So everyone jumped on this story and created a headline of it and put it out there because it was good for business. That's the <laughs> thing. It wasn't just like a sign and it went away and people go, oh my God, did you see that ignorant sign? You got the Twitter people going crazy. And again, it's a relatively small amount of people. But they've all got 18 accounts, so it looks, you know... Well, that may be like more so. than their followers. And then it's the wrestling news sites, the various, the good ones and the bad ones, taking it and running with it, and then it becomes a bigger story than it actually was. 
of I'm just of things that I have seen and heard of people doing and having done to them in wrestling arenas. Um, you know, like I said, I hope this is the worst thing that ever happens to Nyla Rose. And when she looks back on her career when it's finished, she'll say, "Wow, I got I got by without anything really bad happening to me." She maybe she if I wonder if Oki Shakina's wife is still alive. But again, it's I'm not going to compare now to the Wait, I'm way. just talking, well, okay, think about this. Think about the cuz they said her Nyla Rose's wife was up upset on Twitter also, which is a relationship I don't know anything about, don't know who this person is, but she was upset. Oki Shakina in Columbus, Georgia at the Municipal Auditorium, I talked to one of the cops that was actually there. On his way back from the ring, fucking guy walked up and stuck the knife in his stomach and walked halfway around him with it before they fucking knew what was happening. And they got the guy with the knife, but the cops were looking there, and he was a heel, and he was a foreign heel. And they said, well, there's nothing we can do for him. They were just going to let him lay there and bleed out. He's done. He's done for. And his wife was there. I said, please, somebody call an ambulance. Do something. And they saved him. But uh, let me know I don't when think that this is anything like happening that. again. And then I will... Then I will be the first one to go, oh, shit, what a horrible thing that just happened in the fucking arena. Look, realistically, you and I don't know what it is to be trans. You got to think that's not an easy journey. So I can understand some sensitivity from Nyla Rose's wife. But I can't understand the like sensitivity that. from the general people on Twitter that have never met Nyla Rose. Well, there's, you're sympathetic towards someone and you see that. And again, no one knows what Nyla Rose is thinking. No one knows if Nyla Rose is going, oh, this is a fucking idiot. Or if Nyla Rose is going, this is something deeply personal that hurts me. No one knows. Everyone jumps to what they think the reaction should be. But it doesn't change that the guy shouldn't have brought the fucking sign. And there's nothing wrong with people being reasonably pissed about the sign indignant people, i'll people, take indignance people being upset to the point they get about an idiot fan bringing an idiot sign that was on screen for a couple minutes and then we all moved on that's where you know there's a lot of people that they just they look for these things and i'll they, take indignance i just i think that wild hysterical panic was an overreaction i agree with that I also, but we, we both agree the fans should have been thrown out. I'll, I'll even accept that for you now. I thought they just should have set him down and said, you know, fuck it, here, here's the sign, sit down and shut up. But <laughs> what the fuck? I don't care because I don't know who he is either. So I'm in the I don't give a shit moment. <sighs> okay, well, I know what you are saying. What am That's I saying? Butters. Butters. <laughs> what? When Butters became a pimp on South Park and he went down to ask the other pimps for advice on how to handle his bottom bitch and all of his, his various other hoes, every time they'd say, well, you got to do this, you know what I'm saying. And he was taking notes. He said, yes, I know what you are saying. Okay. So next up on the program, <laughs> good Lord, that took a while to get nowhere. Um, did you like Malachi Black and Griff Garrison, Brian? After all that, I'm not sure if I remember it. <laughs> Don't worry, nobody else does either. Malachi Black was against Griff Garrison simply because previously Malachi Black blew the mist in the face of Julia Hart. I, he blew it at Julia Hart. We've covered that he missed. A little of it, the wind blew some of it to Pillman's face. So he was, while Julia was selling, he was screaming, somebody get somebody. And Griff Garrison's the one that's mad. And he wants Malachi Black. And he even, he was so mad. He even asked Brian Pillman last week, whose side are you on? When Pillman was trying to say, hey, don't fucking bite this goddamn bite off of this guy. Cause it's more than you can chew. So anyway, Malachi Black does his spooky entrance and Griff Garrison comes down looking like the water boy from the high school football team trying to buy crack in the hood. He was in way over his head and he didn't know what he was going to do once he got there. But he was so mad at Malachi Black for what he did to their sister, Julia Hart, that he ran immediately into the ring, jumped up on the turnbuckles, turned his back on Malachi Black and urged the fans to cheer for him. So right there, you know, he's pissed. Nobody sits down and goes over these guys, goes over this with these guys 
That would have been the first thing that you would have said to a baby face. You're mad. There's been shit happened to your sister, Julia. Don't go out smiley face and glorify for the crowd. Have your game face on and be looking at this guy like you want to fucking fight him out in the parking lot. Stare a hole there. I stared a hole through a motherfucker one time in a courtroom to the point where he had his attorney tell my attorney that I needed to quit looking at him because it unnerved him so badly. But Griff was happy. Anyway, he was happy until he the bell rang and he ran toward Malachi Black and ate Malachi Black's boot. And then he wasn't happy anymore. And then, for whatever reason, Malachi Black stands there and looks at him and then slides out of the ring and stands there looking at Brian Pillman. And then we found out what the reason was, because he stood there in the right place for Griff Garrison to recover and hit the ropes and come and hit a dive on him. But Griff almost went completely over Malachi Black's head and almost killed them both. So, boom, I knock the guy out with a kick. Instead of trying to pin him, I'm going to slide, slide out and stand right in the perfect place for him to hit me with a dive when I don't do anything to his partner and don't pay any attention to what my opponent's doing. And then, after that, you know, it... <laughs> It was about as bland and awkward a match between a top guy and an underneath guy as I've ever seen. It wasn't smooth, it wasn't exciting, and it wasn't good. And Malachi Black won with a single leg crab where... God damn it. I'm trying to figure out how to explain this. You know when you get a Boston crab, you hook your arms underneath the calves of the guy's legs and lean back, right? Of course, yeah. He had a single leg crab, but he didn't have his arm under the leg behind the calf. He had the, the guy's leg was just bent and Malachi Black was holding it around the, t the knee. So there was no fulcrum in there as you use the arm to cinch back on the, I don't know. Uh, but then he, he won with the crab uh, and then knocked out Pillman with a kick. This is just getting drearier and drearier. Malachi Black is getting less over because he does weird things that don't make any sense. Not weird spooky, but weird don't make any sense. And poor Pillman has now been relegated to the sidekick of the job guy that gets knocked out after the match is over with. Your thoughts? Not really sure what they're doing and where they're going with all this. Pillman Jr. has shown potential in the past. They kind of had a good window to do something with him. His acting is something that leaves a lot to be desired. I don't know. I mean, are they cooling Malachi off right now before they do something again with him? I'm really not sure. Or are they putting him in the tag team division with, the, with whoever, whoever his mystery friend is? I, I, I don't know they're cooling him off on purpose, but that's the result they're getting. Um, and one more thing before we get to the main event. Just real briefly, Matt Hardy and Private Party did back and forth interviews with Jungle Boy and Christian Cage and Dino Douche. And the whole joke in, in these interviews was Jungle Boys talking about pounding their ass, and they're talking about pounding Jungle Boy's ass. And they're not even smiling or smirking or got the twinkle in their eye when they do it. They're saying it straight. So, obviously, they're grown adult men, and they know the first thing that's going to cross everybody's mind when they're talking about pounding each other's asses, but they're not even doing it with a twinkle. They're doing it straight. So, is that homophobic speech? Uh, trying to make a joke out of out of an activity that many people find pleasurable? Or is that just their way of just doing comedy that's not funny and juvenile? In which case, why aren't they back in ringside with the previous unfunny juvenile that had the sign that was making mockery of someone else's sexual practice? These are questions I ask myself. You can't have it both ways. You can't be out pounding ass in one segment and then worried about something else in another one. 
Did you notice that? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was stupid. I don't know what their intent was, but obviously no one really cares considering some of the people involved in this. Nobody wants to see Matt Hardy or any of his associates on TV. We've already established that. Everyone knows it, but Tony Khan likes him, so we're going to keep using him until his contract is up. But since no one cares about any of this, just turn Christian on Jungle Boy now and let's stop wasting our time because no one's really cared about this pairing at all. Just do the turn now. You know what? That would be a, an elevation for Jungle Boy because if he could have matches with Christian, he would learn how, more about how to work without bad habits. He wouldn't be doing all these fucking flips. You'd have a dynamite underdog baby face that would really get over if he had a veteran to lead him. Don't you think that's where this is heading? That's the impression I'm getting. Well, I've long past caring about where any of these people are headed. <laughs> Fair enough. Because they're always fucking together. Anyway, the main event of the evening, a six-man tag with half an hour left in the show. It's a Christmas present. The big entrances, everybody got their, their big entrances, FTR and MJF against Sting, Darby Allen, and Lack Mussolini! On LSD, CM Punk. I know he's straight edge, but I needed some LSD after the first 90 minutes of this program. Uh, a couple of observations. Great sign, MJF stole Christmas. But again, as we've established, they bring signs because they remember the Attitude Era and everybody wanted to be part of the show. Uh, FTR's AAA belts look like license plates for a 36 Packard. And I enjoyed, even though obviously we just did a segment here on how I thought face paint was overdone in wrestling 30 years ago, Punk comes out last with the Sting tights and is face painted in solidarity with, with uh, Sting and Darby Allen and does the Sting howl instead of its clobbering time. Straight out of the Dusty Rhodes playbook. If he was in a six-man with the Road Warriors, he'd wear the spike shoulder pads and the face paint. If he was in a six-man with the Rock and Roll Express, he'd wear the bandanas and blah, blah, blah. So that's, you know, and in Greensboro. Because obviously, the, the people there are going to be even more, what's the word I'm searching for, more, more sympathetic and warm towards Sting because he's been, that was his coming out party and he's been there so many times over so many years, blah, blah, blah. And it had to be a thrill for FTR to work with Sting in Greensboro because they're North Carolina boys. But besides that, I, is was this the best six-man tag that AEW has yet ever presented? I can't think of another one better. I, I, I hear you going through your mental Rolodex now. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. This was really good, though. Um, I can't, every other six man tag that I could think of had the cosplayers and the gymnasts in it. This is the first time they've actually had main event guys in a real wrestling six man tag team match. And there was stories through the whole thing. MJF started out the first thing by ducking punk. And that's what was going to be the recurring theme as it should have been. It's free television. You're teasing the pay-per-view or you're teasing the big event. You're teasing the match down the road. Punk and Dax started out the match by working, which was incredible. And then Cash and Darby got in and did more. Re there was more wrestling in this match than in any normal AEW match. I was amazed at the start that everybody was pitching in and there wasn't a turd in the punch bowl. They finally, they, they did a, a setup to tag Sting in. He got a big pop. And then Punk chases MJF out of the arena. They come back in from the other end. The people wanted to see Punk gets it, get his hands on MJF. Um, but at, at that point, that spot was to end up with all the heels on the floor there to set up Darby coming. You can't even call it a dive. He did a flying body block through the ropes on all three heels and bounced off of them. You heard the smack of the meat in the flesh. And it looked it looked like a pinball going into fucking, you know, the the heels. Boom! It was great, and that was a break spot. And I'll buy that. That was fucking great. And by the time they'd come back from the break, they had stopped Darby Allen for a set of heat on him, and they were kicking the shit out of him. 
And MJF would only get in whenever, you know, everybody was in control and he would want to fuck a little bit with Punk. But the heels were working like heels here. And they even built body slams. They slammed Darby Allen numerous times, just regular slams. And then Cash goes to do it and Darby small packages him and makes a bit of a false comeback because he got a big pop with just one body slam. And then he tags Sting for the real comeback. So they actually not only got a nice little false comeback and he gets a pop with a body slam from an AEW crowd, but then hot tag Sting and Sting makes a real comeback. And then the heels fed for it perfectly and it was an extended comeback. Then he gets the Scorpion and MJF comes and stops him from behind and they go to the break again. It was a fucking brilliant. They come back. Now they've got Sting down there getting some heat on him. But then they do the deal, which I, it's a little comedic for me, but it works because it's Sting. And in Greensboro, even though he had to position himself because he didn't really get it the first time, but he did the thing where they have the double knockout and he's woozy and he falls over and headbutts MJF and the nuts. And then kind of gave a tag to Punk. It could have been hotter, but poor Punk leaped up. I think he was going to springboard off the top rope, but his foot slipped. So he recovered and just landed on his feet in the ring and made a double comeback on FTR. So great save. Couple of false finishes. And then FTR stops him on the turnbuckle and they hit their superplex and big splash off the top for a two count, which was close. MJF had disappeared by this point. He's hiding. Cash and Darby took a great bump over the top rope. And then they did something off camera that popped the people like crazy and put both of them under the timekeeper's table, but there was absolutely no camera shot of it. Brian, remember when I've said that one of the producer's jobs is you have to go over the match that the, besides the fact of giving them the finish and making sure they're not doing anything stupid. Once they've got their match, then you have to hear it because you got to be in the truck to tell the director what's coming up. If it's something crazy. And the reason why that camera shots are missed on these things is because one of two things, either the guys don't bother to tell the producer or the producer forgets and doesn't tell the director. And that's why you get no shot of this off brand shit because nobody expects it to be coming up. So they need to tighten that shit up. But Dax and Punk are in the ring trading. And then FTR hit their finish on Punk, but Sting made the save. And then MJF is back, and he DDTs Sting, but Sting no-sells it and nuts MJF on the ropes. And then I know they're trying to give Sting all these big spots, but Sting ran MJF across the ring and hip-tossed him over the top rope where FTR was waiting to catch him. But you can't... If you're going to hip-toss somebody over the top rope, you have to hip-toss them over the top rope because that turns them. If they dive on their own and they're still trying to be hip-tossed, if you don't put any oomph behind the hip-toss, they're just going over head first, which is what happened. He went head first over MJF or over FTR and almost landed head first on the floor. They broke his fall enough that it didn't break his neck. But do you see what I'm saying? With the turn, Sting should have been underneath MJF's left arm with his right hand and he should have been around MJF's neck with his left hand and he should have got under him good so that when MJF jumped he could have both pushed and turned MJF's head but as it was MJF just dove straight over the top rope and that was a dangerous thing but having said that as soon as they determined that MJF was not paralyzed and might walk again someday Sting comes off the top with a crossbody onto the floor on all three heels, and that got a big pop because fuck, he's 62 and it's Greensboro. Um, and then that was all we got because Punk was lining up MJF for the GTS, but Dax came in and shoved MJF to the floor, 
And then all three baby faces gave Dax <laughs> their finishes and beat him one, two, three. Um, a, a, a great match. And again, FTR lose again. This time it was the, the right finish and the perfect result. It's just all those times that they beat FTR with lesser talent in places they shouldn't have been beat that has now made it, instead of this being a big impactful thing, is like, okay, well, we know FTR loses again. Which is, which is why you should give guys credibility before you start having them do jobs to everybody in sight so that when they do start doing some, it means something. Nobody believes FTR is going to win anything these days because they never do simply because the Hardly Boys are jealous of them and have to prove by a self-fulfilling prophecy that they're not the best tag team in wrestling, even though they are. Your thoughts? I like MJF and FTR together, although I hate them being called MJFTR. I think that's <laughs> stupid. I hope that doesn't stick. I wasn't crazy about Punk coming out with the face paint, and I get the reference to Dusty doing it when he teamed with the Road Warriors or teamed with Sting. But I don't know. It didn't feel right to me. But, you know, it's a minor thing to kind of pick on here. With the MJF moment where I was scared, I thought he broke his neck there for a second. I looked at it like he was overcompensating for an older wrestler who may or may not be able to do what he was trying to get him to do. Maybe I'm wrong. But that's well, the and don't do the spot. Because then it's a rib on yourself. Oh, I'll do this big spot with Sting, and he'll still be walking tomorrow, but I'll be paralyzed. It was good to see Punk, uh, not Punk, uh, MJF do a promo afterwards because it showed that he was alive. So that was good <laughs> to see. But MJF has heat, and he's great. If he does more with FTR away from the Spears and away from the Tullys, Wardlow if you need to, just because you're building to something eventually. They all wore matching colors. Like, it looked good. It looked right. They aren't that far apart in height. It just looked really good. Every, everybody looked professional. Everybody looked in shape. Everybody could work. Everybody seemed serious. It was a level above the, you know, the rest of the flock there in that company. You had three of the best in-ring workers in the whole business on that heel side. And that'll get some people mad because some people say, oh, MJF's not that good or FTR aren't that good. Talk to anyone in the business. In the ring, those guys know what they're doing. And Punk is having just a great 2021. I'm sure he'll have a great 2022. Darby's, I love Darby's dives. I wait for him now because he lays them yeah. in and now I'm seeing him bounce off people. It's even cooler. <laughs> and I'll give AEW credit, although it's, it hasn't always been perfect. And he's gotten some wins over guys like FTR at that show in Queens and different things. It hasn't been perfect. But when you see the way Tony Khan has used Sting for now the last year, and you compare it to all the ways WWE used Sting. Oh, good Lord. Or any other way you could have used Sting right now, and I actually think they've done all right. I will agree with that. I think they could have put a couple of things that he did on pay-per-view instead of free television, because in hindsight, it didn't matter for the ratings that much. But what he has done, for the most part, has been nothing wrong with. And it was a good main event. And, you know, they did a good rating. And I believe the main event ended up pulling similar ratings to the opening of the show, which is a good sign. Usually the viewers are just tuning away, <laughs> not coming back. But it was a good main event. And it went a while, went like a half hour. And I've said it before, the serious stuff on these shows work. And if you have more stuff yeah. with Punk and MJF, and they're aligned uh, wrestlers and Brian Danielson and Adam Page and what they got going on and different things. This is the shit that works and that's really good and that feels like a modern take on the things that worked in classic wrestling. The Bucks and the Best Friends and Adam Cole and all that other shit. It just feels like... I can understand why some people thought that was cute a few years ago, but it feels like everything else is kind of passing that stuff by right now. Hey, the rest of the kids are growing up and the the uh, problem class is being left behind. And I and I think we're going to see more behind the scenes drama probably as they figure out that oh shit, this company now has real talent coming in and it's showing us up. How can we stop that? How can we bury these people? We'll find out who who comes in and has the cachet and the pull in the industry not to get buried on purpose, like a lot of the other people have been that didn't have that same pull. 
well, you know, perhaps if you were brought in and buried and you didn't have any pull, you needed to find a way to get some pull. You needed to find a way to get a good lawyer. I'll tell you what. You're exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you something else. You know, I've talked to our friend who I will mention in a second uh, about some of these things lately. He has filled me in, folks. If you want to find out your legal predicament, whether it's positive, negative, or indifferent, there's only one man that you need to call in this entire world. Call Stephen P. The rest. Yes, I was just talking to our good friend, Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084, wishing him a Merry Christmas. And we, we were talking about these arbitration clauses that he's been paying close attention to, and he's attempting to call people's attention to them so that they won't fall in these traps. They're all over the place. And I should mention, obviously, the way it came up was, of course, my internet service with Spectrum, as well as my cable service. I can't buy pay-per-views, and I can't get the internet speed that I'm paying for, despite the upgrade that I got. And he checked into, actually as a Christmas present for me, suing these rotten, crooked, criminal bastards, Spectrum. But he said, did you know? that when you accept their service in the fine print without even reading anything, you, like a lot of these other contracts that are signed by some of these companies like the WWE or just anybody you have performed services for you or buy utilities from, they have arbitration clauses that say that if you have any problem with them and they don't do what you're supposed to, what they're supposed to do, you can't sue them. You have to go to arbitration or if you're employed by a company and something goes wrong there and somebody mistreats you or harasses you or whatever, you've given up your right to a jury trial like uh, uh, the Bill of Rights supposedly gives us. It goes into arbitration and then the company that you are sideways with gets to determine whether you are at fault or whether the person that works for them is at fault. And guess how that usually goes? So you see, it's all part of all these legal clauses and mumbo-jumbos that people are using to put you, the innocent American citizen, under their thumb and behind the eight ball. And that's where a talented attorney like Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084, can help you or anyone else that's been the victim of greed or avarice by these companies that sell defective products, defective services. As I mentioned, Spectrum, who, as we've mentioned before, their own employees say is a horrible company, and we had the testimony of the serviceman that canceled his service before he was deployed to the Middle East, and then six months later, when they didn't cancel it, they sent one of our servicemen to collection on an account he didn't use while he was deployed. Boy, it just makes me pissed off to think of all the things that people get away with these days. So if somebody thinks they've gotten away with something on you folks, newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Before you do anything, get the advice of an experienced professional. Stephen P. New is the man for you. That's right, a great man, Stephen P. New. Of course, always willing to fight for the little guy, but Jim... Speaking of the little guy, and AEW's filled with them, we have spent so much time talking about dynamite and pizza and other things, and I know we still have to talk about Rampage. We haven't gotten- And there are no questions. We haven't gotten to any questions. So I was going to say, because I think people were expecting questions, people want questions, people maybe got a little hooked on the last two weeks of shows with just nonstop questions. You, the people want questions. They have, qu they have a questions they want answered. We can get together in a few days, do a bonus show, and put up some questions. What do you think? 
Oh, God damn. All right, I guess. Actually, yes, we've just decided we're going to do this, folks, as we're running long today. We're going to do a bonus show this week since there's another omnibus for the uh, experience this coming week for New Year's weekend. So right about that, uh, well, even before that, maybe, we'll go ahead and we'll do another drive through with some bonus questions for the people because it's it's the holiday time and we're feeling good. Well, we'll see how good yeah. we continue to feel. But speaking of the holiday Do time. we have to talk about Rampage now? I was going to say Christmas Rampage. We got to talk about it. Hey, well, Christmas night was the special edition of Rampage because they got bumped from Friday because of the annual marathon of a Christmas story, which, by the way, I continued my tradition. I've never watched that movie from start to finish. I watch it from middle to middle. And then over again. I continue my tradition of not wasting my time watching that movie, oh, which is not very good. Well, you'll shoot your eye out. But anyway, speaking of shooting his, his eye out, I wonder if, if this had been the 1980s and TBS had just purchased AEW, would Hook be coming out with a pirate gimmick? Think about it now. If Jim Hurd was in charge? If Jim Hurd was in charge, he wanted to find Long John Silver. We've seen that actually out of that old reprobate's mouth to a newspaper. Yeah, we got the rights to all the Turner classic movies. If we could find a one-legged wrestler, we'd have Long John Silver. Why didn't he talk to John Laurinaitis? He was there. Could have found him a one-legged wrestler. Maybe two of them. He assigned him the wrong one, though. But anyway, so Hook would have been a pirate, but now Hook is merely one of the great new prospects in wrestling and hook had another match this time against bear Bronson. Now I wonder, it's almost like that somebody who actually understands the wrestling business and how to get people over is in Tony Khan's ear saying, yes, every week he comes out and he has a six minute match with an opponent that he defeats. That's the way you get a wrestler over. It's amazing. It's almost like that Hook has somebody experienced and knowledgeable about wrestling in his immediate social circle or possibly family circle that can tell Tony Khan how to feature this fucking kid. It's amazing. So, uh, having said that, Bear Bronson wasn't bad in this uh, because he, he had heat because they love Hook and his shit didn't look bad. Hook's shit looks like he's in a contest. His throws, his suplexes are cool, as we talked about last week on his debut or whatever it was. Um, He's got attitude. He's got more poise than you would think from a guy that's only had two matches now in front of people. The cross faces right before his chokeout finish were better. He's listening. And the, I, I must admit that I... I glanced over this and then it was somebody on Twitter said, well, what about hook? No selling that, not a pile driver, but like one of those old sh- sit down shoulder breakers that old bear Bronson gave him. And he popped right up the camera shot that the show got was focusing on Bronson popping up. And then you see hook come up behind him afterwards. Yeah. Probably I could have done without that, but otherwise again, He's a great kid, and as long as they don't put him in with the gymnasts, which would be completely antithesis to his style, and as long as they don't run crazy with this and start putting him in main events and just give him steady underneath matches while the people like him and let him show off what he can do, he's got a very bright future. And honestly, without being a smartass, it helps that Taz knows how to get somebody over and can explain to Tony the inexperienced rookie booker of the year, how not to fuck this kid up. What do you think? I was happy as soon as they announced him at two Oh one. I was like, Oh, that's a positive first step. Good point. Also, he, he sounds like a grown man and it's not an egregious exaggeration. I was wondering how this was going to go because his first match was not against a bigger guy. And Hook, as much as everyone's getting into him and I really dig him, he's not a big guy right now either. He's still a young guy. 
But Bear Bronson's a big guy, and I thought Hook did it really good. I'm not crazy about the Road Warrior Hawk sit up from the power bomb spot, <laughs> but if you do it every now and then, it's not egregious. Was it was it the power bomb or that or not power bomb thing I'm thinking about? Forgive me, I said well, power which bomb, ever. but yeah, um, it shows a lot of potential. Look, it's like it's like Kevin Von Erich with a Goldberg push. You know what I mean? <laughs> he reminds me of the Von Erichs when you see the early footage of them where they're laying shit in, and it's like okay, they're working, but boy, they were. Yeah, and they were really laying it in. You got something with them. How do you keep with it and not fuck it up? That's going to be the big question. But you really got something there. I hope they don't fuck it up. There's so much intrigue around this kid from two matches. From a year and a half of appearances and two matches. Do you remember the finish that Kevin Von Erich was doing when he went to Georgia on Georgia TV and what was it, 1981-ish, two-ish, thereabouts? Oh, no, I don't, no. The body scissors. Oh, that's right, yeah. You remember that? And this, I don't know how, Hook looks wiry, but nobody has done that since. Part of it was because Kevin Von Erich was a freak athlete and had the spring in his legs and that power, but if somebody's just said body scissors, how would that be a finish? Von Erich had such strong legs that he would grab the guy and leap up and put his legs around the guy's midsection like a bear hug, but with the legs and would fucking clamp down and be freestanding, hanging on the guy where the guy, oh shit, he can't breathe. And it would, sl- it would take him down to the ground where he would be rolled up in this body scissors and pinned. But the, the visual of Kevin with his legs around this guy and his upper body suspended in the air by the grip of his legs, sold the fucking move. Nobody's done it since. Maybe they don't have the legs for it. Maybe Hook can look that up. I don't know. I don't want to see him do leg scissors. Well, I'm just saying, he seems so athletic and wiry. Nevertheless. Who do you program him with? I mean... Well, nobody right now. So how long do you do this? Do you do it every week? And how long do you do what they're doing right now with Hook? No, if if you did it every week, then you would expect him imminently in the next eight to ten weeks or whatever. It wouldn't be that long these days, but you know what I'm saying? You would expect him to imminently be involved in something which would be a little fast for him because he's brand new. If he comes out every three weeks, has a match like that, and it's maybe excerpted or video highlighted or talked about in a training package or a promo or b-roll over a 30 second interview on a show in the middle you keep him out there and you keep people aware of his presence without shoving him down their throats because the weekly wins are for guys that you bring in to get over to use now and that's not a guy that's had two matches. So it needs to be a little slower, a little more drawn out, and you don't want to. And also, eventually, after the first three or four or five, he's got to lose one. But he looks better in losing to a top guy, a heel that can fuck him around a little bit or whatever, than he would beating another job guy that week. And it proves that he can get out in the deeper end of the pool. and and. There's no reason why that could not go on for months and months because he's not being focused on to carry the ball, but he's certainly a valuable member of the team. Just off top of my head. Let's see what they do. It'll be interesting to see if they screw it up or not. And, you know, he hasn't had anyone at ringside with him, even though he's a member of Team Taz. Let's see what they do. But as I said before, there's a lot of intrigue right now around Hook and. I hope AEW doesn't mess it up. And actually, it's refreshing he doesn't have anybody at ringside with him because everybody knows Taz is on commentary and Taz is his dad. Obviously, that's been... But he doesn't... For the the opposition he's in with, he hasn't needed anybody at ringside to handle him. And if he had people at ringside, even if it's Team Taz, then it's just another guy out there with 16 people at ringside. We've already got that a lot of other places in this company. What do you think of the clothesline? (laughs) Um, that was nice also, by the way. And that's the thing, the kid, he can, he can sell. We saw that when he's been on defense and it doesn't look shit and he doesn't look out of place. And at the same time, those trips 
especially the leg trips. I, that little in, the one where he throws the leg in and then behind the guy's leg and moves forward with his body to effectively schoolboy trip the guy from the front. I'm sure that's a judo move, and I'm sure Taz knows the name of it, but the first person I saw use it was Adrian Street 40 years ago. That's an old shoot takedown from the European school of shoot wrestling. And so it just, it's, you know, it's amazing. I haven't seen anybody use that in 40 years. And it's a guy that's had two matches and it's a little bit different because he's a little taller and thinner than Adrian. Adrian was short and squat and he could really get down low boy and his center of gravity. You couldn't fucking pick him up. He used to be able to squat down with a guy's arm across his stomach and tie the guy up with no arms and no legs just by bending over the arm around his waist. And then he had his arms free to gouge the guy's eyes. So anyway, nice second match hook. Did you see the Layla Hirsch, Chris Statlander match? Cause I actually was surprised how much I liked it. All right. And you mentioned that to me. I was I just reviewing the program and I was in Cody and Sammy for the TV title. And you said, oh, you got to watch that girls match. It's not as bad as you would have thought. I said, well, I'll go back afterwards after I finish this. And then, of course, as soon as I finished the Cody match and the option came up, delete, I did. And then as soon as I hit it, I went, no, don't delete. And it was gone. So I don't know about Layla and the Andromedan alien. Despite the gimmick and despite the height difference, you know, Chris Statlander looks gigantic and Layla Hirsch is maybe the tiniest in terms of height wrestler on the roster. I thought they did a good job. I thought they did a good job of Layla working a body part and they teased a little bit of a Layla Hirsch heel turn, I guess. But I thought all things considered, it was a good match. So Statlander is getting better. That's what you're saying. Statlander, I think, is getting better. And I think Layla Hirsch, who we don't see that often, is pretty good. And she's different. Look, she brings a different edge to that women's division. Her name is legit Layla Hirsch. And she actually seems like a legit athlete. And you kind of believe she could grab someone's arm and mess them up. <laughs> so I, like, I hope they do something with her. That nasty arm grabber. Well, the main event on this particular program was, again, for the TV title, Sammy Guevara and Cody Rhodes. And Cody got booed out of the Coliseum, even in, in Greensboro. The scene of some of Dusty's greatest triumphs. Also, one of the first towns to start booing Dusty, that front row. Well, that's true. Yeah, front row section D. But um, David Crockett was at ringside to present the title belt to the winner, got a nice ovation. I saw here Sammy Guevara has become a big-time babyface and has gotten confident in himself. And he's got the energy and the enthusiasm we've always liked. Remember, as a heel, I said he had a slappable face. As a babyface, he's got that that oomph and that enthusiasm that makes you happy when he does something. Does that make any sense? It gives you a good, a, a, a warm, fuzzy feeling when he accomplishes something. He just looks so happy. It makes some sense. And I think to your earlier point, the fans love him. The fans there in yes. AEW really love him. And, you know, in this match, regardless of everything else, Cody can work physically and athletically and his matches and sometimes what he does or the psychology behind the other stuff is whatever the fuck but he can have a good match and sammy was starting out working this giving cody a lot of his own offense that was a cute and it's a baby face match again except that one of the baby faces is as popular as crotch rot but the one problem i had at the start or not at the start but near the beginning it's a baby face match, but they just spill out to the floor and Sammy goes out to the floor and beats Cody up. And then Cody beats Sammy up and they're bouncing each other off the steel railing. And it's a baby face match. There should be a reason for a lose temper spot instead of, okay, it's just, I'm going to work with another baby face that I'm supposedly share a locker room with. And that is not tried to cheat me or have anybody interfere in their match on their behalf it's just well, i'm fighting him one-on-one -on -one in a fair fight but now we're going to go out on the floor and bounce each other off the railing and everything just like i would do a heel 
it, it there should be a lose temper spot amongst baby faces before it gets to that point to make sense. That's every baby face match I've ever seen had one in there. But anyway, until lately, till modern times, Cody missed that moonsault and Sammy started making a comeback. He would have missed it if Sammy hadn't moved to begin with. But hey, you know what the heck. And then Sammy did a springboard flip off the top rope to the floor and missed Cody. And then Cody grabbed him and power bombed him into the crowd of who was the the actual ringside crowd uh, who I hope were Cody's friends and or inviting invited guests because he just threw Sammy Guevara on top of a bunch of fans if that wasn't the case and I doubt very seriously if he did that cuz he I'm sure Cody likes the home he's living in and doesn't want to lose it in the judgment. So, but that, again, you're showing guys getting thrown on purpose into the crowd. I don't know if you're giving a right message when that happens, especially with the way things have been going modern times here lately where people want to get in on the act anyway. But finally, Cody hits the crossroads, gets a two count, Sammy kicks out, Okay, so Cody is picking up his limp body and he puts it on the turnbuckle and he goes for a big move, but Sammy drops behind after being seconds earlier hit with Cody's finish and limp. He drops behind and picks Cody up and hits the GTH finish where he does Punk's finish, but he gives the guy the flip the other way. I'm not sure, but whether he might have not have should have found a new finish when CM Punk actually came into company. But nevertheless, that was a two count. And then Sammy took forever to go up to the top and did a double flip. So what is, what is that? A 780 or a 760? How many degrees is a double flip front flip off the top rope? 720? Three says 720. There you go. Good math, man. But Cody raised his knees. Boom, and then Cody hit two crossroads one after another and then hit him with a pile driver. One, two, three. And the people hated that. I wasn't much on the finish because people were getting hit with finishes and then suddenly popping up moments later, seconds later. Uh, but the people really hated the finish in terms of the winner. And of course, Cody's team team comes in to celebrate now with brandy brandy had to come in what is it with these wives they've always got to have some spotlight so cody's team is celebrating in the ring that he's just beaten one of the most popular baby faces in the company for the title that he previously held and th this is not a an on-purpose heel turn why how? He just he just beat one of the most popular guys on the roster after already being booed out of the building everywhere. And this is supposed to somehow make people like him? Well, now they're leaning into it, clearly. Well, you would think, but... It, I, except now, I don't know, if he does become a heel, they'll start cheering him. No, they won't. No, they up. won't. No, they won't. <laughs> Just to be smart asses? I think they see him as a heel in real life. And they want to treat him like that when he's in the ring. It would be like MJF. MJF's a heel and they don't cheer him. I'm not saying Cody would be as good as MJF. But I think it would be different. And I think they would boo him. I think if Cody turns heel, Cody's going to be treated like a heel. It's not going to be Britt Baker. <laughs> well, anyway, what do you think of this contest? Had its moments, didn't it? Had its moments... I don't know what to think. I was against them taking the belt off Miro because he was really coming into his own. And we haven't seen him do anything except for these stupid promos for the last few weeks. I don't know if he's hurt or if they're just waiting to get him back on TV, but... I think they're waiting to get him back from the multiverse. He's caught in limbo. Yeah, I don't know where all he is. All that white space all around him. Thank God there's a camera there, so at least we know he's alive. That's the only thing that exists in that particular universe is Miro and the camera. 
Everything else completely blank. I was against them getting a belt off Miro. They put it on Sammy. I wasn't feeling it, but you know what? They have him on TV. He's defending the belt. He's had a handful of title defenses, I would think. I was shocked they took the belt off him right away. I'm not saying not say right away, but right now, I guess. This quick. Putting it on Cody's interesting. I'm not going to just shit on that out of hand. Cody was the first TNT champion. He's now the TNT champion with a very different dynamic. He was TNT champion with no fans. Now it's a completely different dynamic. What are they going to do and how are they going to handle this? They have a real opportunity here to capture what is happening with the fans and Cody and run with it. But if they're going to continue doing this wishy-washy, he acts like a baby face, they boo him. He acts like he's surprised, then he plays into it. That can only go on so long. You have to shit or get off the pot. Either make him a heel, or have him once again announce that he refuses to be a heel no matter what. And then I'll make him a heel anyway. But, you know, I don't know where they're going to go. I'm so intrigued well, here's, here's an by idea. the idea of it's... heel Cody. And I want to see it happen. I, I think it would be great, but I don't have confidence in these guys doing it and doing it right. Is this a result of is this the result of this match is it to further magnify the heel feeling toward cody and play a part in the story or do they just put the tnt title back on him because he's going back on that goofy game show well the reality on the, on the show. network they're filming the reality show aren't they well but no the, the go big show is also is coming back they've been playing commercials for that i think they've got new judges but cody's still on it they've got a couple of new judges so is he just supposed to be the champion of the network because he's on a goofy fucking game show? Or does this actually have something to do with the wrestling company for once? And then that's what started the blowback of the fans against Cody because they already figured, hey, are you ever going to fucking concentrate on this wrestling company like everybody else is? Or are you going to do a reality TV show and a game show and potentially a, you know, fucking name that tune? Whatever. Or are you just going to come back and fucking wrestle? Just put him on the show Wednesday and get him in the ring and don't let him rehearse anything or practice anything. Just let him feed off the room and respond. Like, that's the moment we need. Not Cody going to do a promo that he's rehearsed and thought about and asked everyone about. And workshopped. And it never feels right. And it always misses the mark. Just go out there and, and react to the room. Because that's the other thing. Cody had this match. Have we heard Cody say a word on TV in weeks? Arn's no, been doing the, the talking. La the last thing I heard him say on TV was, I'm on fucking fire! And those are my thoughts about Rampage. <laughs> and by the way, he's still got the, the scab marks from being set on fire on his back. Yeah, those aren't going away anytime soon. Have you ever had no. a bad sunburn on your shoulders? I mean, <laughs> those I, burn I marks I try to are avoid the away. sun at all costs, but I, yeah, I, that ain't going away anytime soon. But Rampage did, and we can be thankful for that. We certainly can, and as we said earlier, a mid-show or a late-show decision, we're going to do a bonus drive through later this week in a few days with nothing but questions. It may not be four hours, but it will be nothing but your questions on the show later this week. And I think with that, we're not even going to play a song. We're going to save the songs for the bonus drive through later this week. Boy, you're loading that, that card up now. Is this in competition? Is this our version of, of New Year's Day or New Day or whatever the fuck the WWE pay-per-view? Day one. No. Well, that wouldn't be day one because we're going to put it out before... Right. New Year's Day. We're going to put out day 31. That's We're, gonna yeah, it's going to be day show. 31 of the drive through <laughs> All right, well, it's your show, and I thank you for letting me be a part of it today. Well, we appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Of course, you are the star of this here drive through and this drive through will be opening again later this week, wherever you find your favorite podcast, or, of course, go to the official Jim Cornette YouTube page, YouTube channel, I should say. Just search for Jim Cornette. It'll pop up right away. Full episodes. Clips of episodes, omnibus collections, all with the Travis Heckle artwork that you have known and loved for so long, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Don't forget, access classic episodes of the drive through Any Experience by becoming a patron. Patreon.com slash Cornette. $5 a month gets you in the door and access to an amazing archive of interviews and, of course, classic episodes. Don't forget, we have just put up acapella, Jim singing The Cult of Meat with Extra Cheese. Jump on that right now, the track that is sweeping across the nation 
as we speak. What else do I usually plug here at the end of the show? You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com. In the new year, hiring help and more items available for sale on a more regular basis. At jimcornette.com. The drive-thru is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until later this week on the bonus drive-thru, and even later this week on the Omnibus, and of course on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel, For Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!